If Master Chief is my Xbox dad, then Kratos is my PlayStation dad. Odd way to begin a video, but that's the sort of nostalgia we're dealing with when talking about the God of War series. Now this analogy probably doesn't make a lot of sense and is very strange, I know, but let me explain. God of War is one of only a few series that I've actually grown up playing. I first played the original God of War at 8 years old, then the sequel at 10, Chains of Olympus at 11, God of War 3 and Ghost of Sparta at 13, Ascension at 16, and finally God of War, the Viking one, at 21. Now, say what you will about whether I should or shouldn't have been playing this series so young, I think I turned out okay, but nevertheless, that's a good chunk of my formative years where at some point I was playing a God of War game, and I wouldn't have it any other way. But I'm being rather general at this point, and each game will get their own nostalgia story. That's me trying to subtly say that if you're new to the channel, subscribe if you want to see the videos about the rest of this series. But let's go back to where it all began. I initially discovered God of War back in 2005, during a family gathering, or maybe just a general visit to my uncle's place. During this visit or gathering, I went over to my uncle's PS2 collection to pick a game to play, probably looking for the Wrath of Cortex, but instead, I found God of War. I know, big contrast, but there was just something about this box art that made me want to find out more, and so I booted the game up. I managed to get to Athens before it was time to head home, but I was immediately hooked and so asked my uncle if I could borrow it. He said yes, and well, the rest is history. I played God of War over and over and over again, playing the game on various difficulties, going after all the secrets, going online to learn more about this historical setting, and Greek mythology in general. I was obsessed, and I've been a God of War fan ever since. With that all being said though, I haven't played through the original God of War in probably over a decade, and as easy as it would be to think the game is flawless forever, at some point you need to put that nostalgia to the test. So that's what we're going to do today because, well, you all voted for it. How well does God of War hold up over 16 years later and is it worth your time revisiting or playing for the first time? Let's find out. God of War began development back in 2002 under the working title Dark Odyssey. David Jaffe, the game's creative director, was given, quote, a rare opportunity for a game designer, as Sony gave him near complete creative control to develop God of War on his terms, which, given the game's sizable budget, is, well, as Jaffe said, rare, but well earned after his success with the Twisted Metal series. The original concept for God of War came from Jaffe's experience playing Oni Musha and saying, Let's do that, but with Greek mythology. The reason Greek mythology was the basis for this project was due to how Jaffe visualized the myths themselves and seeing the gameplay mechanics clear as day, such as Medusa's head, Zeus's thunderbolts, and simply battling creatures like the Cyclops was all primed to be experienced in a video game. The team at Santa Monica had a lot of freedom to modify these myths though, as Jaffe really wanted the coolest aspects of the subject matter because whilst he liked the more kid stuff of Greek mythology such as the fantasy elements, the monsters and the big set pieces, he wanted more violence, more of an adult version like the Greek myths met a heavy metal magazine. The inspirations for God of War were plentiful, including 1981's Clash of the Titans, Devil May Cry, Prince of Persia, Ico, The Legend of Zelda, but perhaps most importantly, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. The reason Raiders of the Lost Ark was such an important inspiration for God of War actually relates back to Jaffe's cancelled project, Dark Guns. Dark Guns was a four-year project that, as Jaffe describes, was made out of fear and anxiety after Twisted Metal 2, a game surrounded by negativity that was eventually scrapped and Jaffe felt like he had missed out on a massive opportunity. After developing another Twisted Metal game though, he once again was asked, well, what next? This is where God of War was born, as Jaffe vowed not to make the same mistake 
again. He needed the next game to be made with passion, not fear, and the inspiration he needed was within Raiders. Jaffe wanted people to experience God of War like his 10 year old self experienced Raiders of the Lost Ark. And not only that, but just be a game that he wanted to play. This feeling and general philosophy for God of War meant that the game was never really intended to reinvent the action adventure genre and just focus on the game being a good time to play. But also, if God of War was going to be compared to the other games, make sure it's the better game of the comparison. God of War was finally revealed to the public in 2004, garnering mass amounts of hype after the hands-on events and just one year later and after three years of development, God of War would be released in March 2005. Critically, the game received universal acclaim, and commercially, God of War sold over 1 million copies in its first year, and well, the rest is history. Today, you can't think about PlayStation without God of War, and it's a series that has cemented itself amongst the gaming greats. But does that necessarily mean the original God of War holds up all these years later? And most importantly, does playing God of War equal sex? You should play God of War because it'll get you laid. Well, that's one question answered. The story for God of War begins with our protagonist, Kratos, cursing the gods of Olympus for abandoning him as he stands atop the tallest cliff in Greece and then proceeds to throw himself into the waters below. The screen fades to black and then we come to learn the story for God of War actually takes place for the most part three weeks prior. That's how God of War begins and we will come back to this moment but first we need to go over Kratos' backstory. I know usually I break down the story as it happens for the player but with flashback storytelling that isn't the best approach at least that I've found and because Kratos' history is such a big part of the plot I think it just makes sense to go over how Kratos got where he is now in God of War first. Kratos was once a fearsome Spartan warrior, becoming the youngest captain of Sparta's army. He was a successful captain, as he commanded thousands, but with that success brought bloodlust and a thirst for power. The Spartans' success would soon run out though. In a battle against a barbarian horde, his army was massacred and Kratos was about to face his end. In an act of desperation, Kratos offered his life and service to Ares, the god of war, in exchange for Ares' aid in battle. Ares, sensing a great power within Kratos, agreed and destroyed the barbarians, but also granted and bonded Kratos with the Blades of Chaos, the now iconic pair of chain blades forged in the depths of the underworld. Kratos was now the servant of Ares, leading his Spartan army and blindly killing hundreds in the name of the God of War. In one battle, Kratos and his army came across a village who worshipped the goddess Athena, burning the village's homes and killing anyone they came across. And it's here Ares would put Kratos into a bloodthirsty rage. Despite his own doubts and the local oracle's warnings, Kratos entered the village's temple and slaughtered everyone within. And then all became clear. Kratos' last two victims had been his own wife and daughter, as Ares explains that this village was his way of testing Kratos' power, and simultaneously trying to sever the last of his humanity. Kratos' actions that day would stay with him forever, both mentally and physically, as the local oracle curse Kratos by binding the ashes of his dead family to his skin, giving him a pale appearance as well as the title that would be feared by all of Greece, the Ghost of Sparta. Kratos, now consumed by the constant nightmares of his actions, renounces his service to Ares and vows to serve the other gods of Olympus in the hopes of ridding himself of these cursed visions. This brings us back to the start of the game and Kratos has now been serving the gods of Olympus for 10 years. Kratos is on his way to Athena's city of Athens, which is under siege by Ares and his army out of hatred and jealousy between the gods. But whilst on the Aegean Sea, 
Kratos' ship is attacked by Ares' forces, and Poseidon tasks Kratos with killing the Hydra, a monster who has plagued the god of the sea's waters for years. We slay the Hydra in brutal fashion, and Athena approaches Kratos to ask for his help. Athena wants Kratos to stop Ares and save Athens, a task Kratos agrees to, but on one condition. Kratos wants the gods to rid him of his nightmarish memories and allow him a chance at redemption. Once we arrive in Athens, we fight our way through the hordes of Ares' legions until we find the Oracle of Athens, and it's from her that Kratos learns how to beat Ares, and that's by obtaining the power to kill a god. Such power is not in Athens though. That power comes from Pandora's box, which the gods fear for well, for the reason I just said, and so it's locked away within Pandora's temple, which is on the back of the Titan Kronos, who is cursed to wander the desert of lost souls for eternity. Kratos makes his way across the desert and into Pandora's death trap of a temple, and retrieves Pandora's box. Ares feels Kratos has succeeded though, and hurls a pillar from Athens to the temple, and straight through Kratos, killing him. Ares steals Pandora's box and Kratos gets sent to the underworld. Kratos manages to escape Hades' realm after help from the mysterious gravedigger we met in Athens, as he tells Kratos that Athena is not the only god watching over him. Back amongst the living, Kratos regains Pandora's box and we finally confront Ares. Ares becomes desperate after Kratos proves his power, and in an attempt to drive Kratos insane, Ares traps him in an illusion, making him relive the death of his family. This illusion ultimately fails, and in a last ditch attempt to stop us, Ares strips Kratos of the Blades of Chaos, leaving Kratos at the mercy of the God of War without a weapon. That is until we spot a convenient giant sword, formerly a bridge, and with it, Kratos kills the god of war. Kratos is praised and forgiven by the gods of Olympus, despite mourning the death of Ares. But removing Kratos' nightmares wasn't part of the offer, and this leads us all the way back to the very beginning of the game, except this time, it keeps playing. Athena pulls Kratos from the sea, explaining that he has served the gods well, and that there is now an empty throne that must be filled. Someone must take Ares' place, and that someone is Kratos. We are transported to Olympus, and the story ends with Kratos claiming the throne of the God of War. The story for God of War, to put it simply, is epic. I mean, we're dealing with a story centering around killing a god. Epic is sort of implied, but with the twists and turns and the overall presentation of the story itself, it really is an epic tale to experience. The way the story is told isn't unique, such as showing the ending at the start and then going back and showing the player how we got there. It's nothing new, but that doesn't mean it's not effective. These sorts of techniques are used because they work. Showing Kratos leaping to his believed end right at the beginning gets the play's intrigue going. It's a story hook and it works because they effectively expand on Kratos as a character quickly enough to grasp some sort of understanding of him as a character, but also continuously adding more and more to his story. And that keeps the player engaged, especially when constantly in the back of your mind you're thinking, how did Kratos end up on that cliff, I wonder? The story of Kratos is often one that gets overlooked because on the surface, Angry Man is angry, and it's just an oversimplification. Yes, Kratos is an anger-filled sociopath who kills anyone or anything that gets in his way. But he wasn't always like this. The flashbacks do show Kratos to still be the bloodthirsty Spartan we know today, but it's when we see his reaction to him murdering his family and his interaction with his family in the illusion that does show Kratos' soft spot. This is an important moment because one, it shows Kratos had his limits and this is why he doesn't anymore. And two, it's after his family's death where he has just been cursed to forever wear their remains, the god he pledged his life to made him do it, and by the time we see Kratos again, it's been 10 years where every day he has had to mentally revisit this event. He becomes an understandable character. Don't get me wrong, 
he's an ass, but that mental tax Kratos is under makes his actions and responses understandable. I also really enjoyed the feeling of a continuous curse about Kratos. Obviously, there is the initial one, but even after all his work and service to the gods, they still don't allow him to forget his past. But they won't let him die either, going so far with this that they make him a god. It's very bleak and twisted, and I love it. As a fan of Greek mythology, I think it's hard not to love seeing these fables make an appearance in gaming as well. Seeing the fable of Kronos, Pandora's box, Athena, Ares, Zeus, Poseidon and Hades, the underworld and Mount Olympus in a game to this day is exciting for me. As I said in the development segment, these myths were not intended to be spot on, but for gods like Ares who represents the distasteful aspects of brutal warfare and slaughter, and Hades represented as, well, not a villain for once, or the aesthetic of Mount Olympus, these are seemingly pretty spot on here in God of War, which is great to see. As per usual though, I don't think the story is without flaws, and for me the big one centers around Pandora's temple. The story comes to such a screeching halt at the temple, which I want to say is roughly about half the game's runtime. The story mostly centers around the architect in this part of the game, which whilst I enjoy for his parallels with Kratos, I want that story to be the side story and not the focus of an area. Pandora's Temple is just such a large section of the game and it doesn't feel like they struck the right balance of story and gameplay on this one. I will also say on the nitpickier side, I think Ares could have gotten a little more time to shine and really highlight him as this great antagonist, but we still do have enough motivation to kill him so this isn't such a big deal for me. Overall though, I just really enjoyed God of War's story, and I think that's pretty obvious by this point. The journey of development we experience with Kratos makes him feel like a human being. Sure, he's angry, he hates the world, and he kills everything in his way. I'm not saying he's a good person, but when you learn about his past and what he's living through, he becomes an understandable character. The setting amidst Greek myths is honestly just epic, and the storytelling here is just really well done. There are issues undoubtedly, but for a story that doesn't get a lot of respect, kinda like another Of War series I know, it gives you a lot more than just an angry man on a mission to kill a god. God of War does begin to show its age in regards to its gameplay, and no, it's not really a negative, it just feels like the first game in the series, which it is. Obviously replaying God of War today, I've played through the series this game created and I've seen how the gameplay has improved and expanded. But there's a reason the gameplay formula never really strayed too far from what we experience here in the original God of War. Well, I mean, not including the most recent God of War. And that's because it's still a bloody good time to play to this day. What is the God of War formula though? Well, God of War is a third person action adventure with a fixed camera perspective and centering around hack and slash combo based combat, platforming and puzzles. But more specifically, this is the God of War formula. Yes, I did make up the percentages, but this is what it feels like. As you can see, for an action adventure game, God of War leans pretty heavily into the action category, and because the combat is such a big piece of this pie, well it just makes sense to talk about it first. If I was to describe God of War's combat in a single word, well I'd have a few to choose from such as simple, satisfying, repetitious even, but I'd probably go with flowing. There's such a great flow to God of War's combat. The way Kratos moves when he switches between light and heavy attacks, creating new combinations, grabbing an enemy and whipping them around the arena, dodge rolling around massive enemies, perfectly timed blocks, all of these whilst mixing in the numerous magic abilities, switching between the Blades of Chaos and the Blade of Artemis, and then building up to using the Rage of the Gods ability to unleash maximum badass. Each movement just flows into one another so effortlessly, which for a hack and slash combo chasing system is what you want. 
it feels good to see that combo meter going up because firstly, it goes away quite quickly. So it makes it feel like you've earned every single digit in that combo. But secondly, it just feels like, well, like you've unleashed a death dance against your foes. I don't know what it is, but the way the Blades of Chaos move around and the way Kratos moves with them, it feels very dance-like. It gives me a Dancer of the Boreal Valley vibe, or vice versa technically, which probably contributes to the overall feeling of flow. The enemies are a big contributing factor as to why this game flows so well. The AI isn't Flash by any means, but they're still a threat. The Wraiths gave me a hard time constantly, which is embarrassing, especially in the right combinations, and they force the player to find specific weaknesses and potential strategies when you're ambushed. Such as undead legionnaires with no armor are best to grab and whip around, hurting other enemies. In tight proximity, maybe consider busting out the Blade of Artemis since range shouldn't be an issue. Or the bigger the enemy, like the Minotaur or Cyclopses, the more useful Medusa's gaze may be, or combinations that stun an enemy or have good range. This brings me to the infamous Quick Time events. Another mechanic that gives the player more to think about in combat, as enemies like the Gorgon have trickier QTEs but are a great source of magic, making for a great risk versus reward, especially if you're on lower health and mess up these prompts, you're done and you need to restart. There's something just satisfying about wailing on a Cyclops, for example. Seeing that big red circle appear and then brutally slaughtering them. It's visually a badass reward for the player, even if some prompts make you feel like your finger is having a spasm, and sometimes the grab to initiate these moments flat out doesn't work. That's always fun. The combat really does hit its peak towards the end of the game though, and that's simply because by that point, you've gotten all the magic abilities, you've leveled up the Blades of Chaos and unlocked more combinations, and in general, you're just better by that point. In God of War's beginning, repetition can rear its head much more frequently. Less enemy variety, less combo possibilities, you just have less, which means you fall into somewhat of a routine at times. For example, the best magic ability is by far Poseidon's Rage. It covers a big area, which through leveling just becomes a monstrous area of effect, can be used multiple times in a battle if you have full magic, and the competition for most of the game is Medusa's Gaze, which is more effective for small encounters like a pair of Minotaurs or Cyclopses, and Zeus's Fury that are used once to progress. It's just too good and only get some competition when you unlock Hades army, which is too close to the end. Unlocking Hades army earlier or Poseidon's rage later would have fixed this one-sided magic battle. The same can be said for the square square triangle combo. You have it from the game's beginning and it just is a little too effective as it stuns most enemies and multiple at a time, which for situations where you're on the clock this combo is just your go-to. Again, probably should be unlocked either later in the game or beef up the other combos, effectiveness to avoid an over-reliance on a single combination. But in general combat, it doesn't take long to break a repetitious sort of routine, whether it be a new enemy, a new mix of all the enemies, adding a task to complete whilst in battle, new weapons or magic, or simply by leveling up and unlocking more combos, or more powerful magic. It's just good to have options and variety in this sort of combat system, and the longer you play, the more you have. It's really that simple. On the nitpickier side, I do wish you could get more magic through combat like the Rage of the Gods ability. Whilst you usually find magic chests after each encounter, you have about two or three good magic uses which is going to be used on either Hades or Poseidon, and because you rarely get more magic in combat, Medusa and Zeus's abilities just will rarely, if ever, get used because compared to the other abilities, they just don't stack up. I do also think the leveling could have been a bit speedier, not in regards to lowering the asking price, just literally buying the levels is a time sink and could have been a lot quicker. But when I think of God of War now, I think big boss fights against mythical monsters or gods, probably because God of War 3 is so damn awesome. So what are the bosses like here? 
well, they're sort of just all right. All three fights are visually still on point and it feels great to take on these massive beings one on one for that power trip. But they all have issues. The Hydra has a bit too much health making the fight drag for a little too long. Pandora's Guardian seems like it should have different phases of the fight but it doesn't really change bar a bit of a speed difference when you take its armor off. And Ares is a good fight until he takes away all your abilities, leaving you to block and wait for openings. I did enjoy aspects of each boss. I loved the satisfaction of impaling the Hydra's heads, stripping the mechanical parts of Pandora's Guardian, and the aspect of killing a god and doing so with all your tools you've accumulated along this journey, but there is just aspects of each fight that make me go, yeah, that was alright, but could have been better. The bosses in particular was when I noticed how spoiled I'd been by the other entries in this series. They upped their game after the original. But as the almighty pie chart said, God of War's gameplay isn't all combat. So how is the platforming and the puzzles? I'll begin with the good. The puzzles act as a great breather from the combat, especially for someone like myself, who to be honest isn't the fastest at puzzle solving, which means I get a longer break from combat, which trust me at times, is needed. Not all the puzzles are head scratches or winners, some just requiring a simple pull of a lever a few times or pushing blocks a little too slowly, but my favourites had to be surrounding Pandora's temple and the architect, which it's just a big puzzle of progression and a great time to try and piece it all together. However, whilst the puzzles act as a much needed and welcome addition to the gameplay, the platforming is less so. Mechanically, it's not horrible jumping around certain obstacles and searching for secrets like the health and magic upgrades because it's all well and good and some platforming puzzles like again in Pandora's Temple are intense fun. My problem is the climbing combat, the balance beams platforming and the notorious Hades spike wall. First of all, climbing combat is terrible. It's so incredibly boring, not a challenge and just a chore. Like, why do these segments need to be here? There wasn't enough fighting, no need for a breather. It just doesn't add anything to the game when what the game needed was a reprieve from all the combat, which the puzzles and the platforming should be. For the most part, I have less of an issue with the balance beam segments. It just depends on how the camera is set up since you can't alter it yourself. The top down view is super easy to understand where you are on the beam as opposed to the more angled view. Don't get me wrong, why there are so many of these moments, I don't know, but they aren't awful, just confusing why it was so heavily a part of the core gameplay. Lastly, the spike wall. I understand that leaving Hades realm should be difficult. And I'll admit, learning these pillars patterns is kind of satisfying. The problem is if just one of these spikes even grazes a finger hair, you'll be right back at the bottom. The brutality and harshness of this segment just overstays its welcome for me. I know I've been rather negative in this segment of the video, but don't get me wrong, God of War is still an absolute blast to play today. As I said though, it definitely feels like the series beginnings, which is what it is. The combat has such a great pace and flow about it that makes it so much fun to cause absolute chaos, especially when accompanied by the masterful soundtrack. Just playing the game for the first time from a critical perspective, it's got some problems. Some aspects feel a little rushed, which is acknowledged by Jaffe himself. Notice how nothing is guarding Pandora's box? That's strange, isn't it? But at the end of the day, when it was all said and done, and maybe this is my nostalgia talking a little bit, but I just had a big old smile from ear to ear. It's simple, not everything works as well as I remembered, but it's still a lot of fun to play all these years later. Was God of War as good as I remembered? No. It wasn't, but to be fair, my own expectations due to nostalgia had gone wild over the course of time. Do I now have a new appreciation for the original God of War though? Absolutely. No one can deny this game is as influential as it gets in the gaming industry. 
Seeing how the series evolved and improved whilst building off such a solid foundation, God of War is a game I would say is the definition of a gaming classic. The story is so rich and told incredibly, creating a character like Kratos who is now just so damn iconic. The combat is simple, testosterone fueled, chaotic, good fun, and the puzzles are a great way that the game breaks up the chaos, slows the game down a tad, and makes you focus up. God of War does have its share of problems as I've gone over in the various segments, but to put it simply, nostalgia or not, this is still a great game to play all these years later, and if nothing else, I'm just foaming at the mouth to finally revisit God of War 2. Do you ever have those series in gaming that you absolutely love and you've played each entry in that series, and yet somehow you still just forget some games in said series? Maybe it's just me, but I've got a couple of those series and one of them is God of War. Immediately, I'm sure some of you are thinking, oh, Chains of Olympus, Ghost of Sparta, maybe Ascension. I could see how you could forget about those games, but no, they aren't it. I don't know why, but I just don't remember a whole heap about God of War 2. I remember I played it initially because one of my best friends got stuck on Zeus's quick time event, but instead of just doing that for him, I played through the whole game myself. But all I can really remember from that playthrough is mainly just the Colossus fight and some of the bigger puzzles. I don't remember the story, most of the bosses, the level design, the abilities, hardly any of it. Really, all I had was a general feeling of, yeah, that was a good game. So after I finished up revisiting the original God of War in the last video, I was really excited to jump straight into God of War 2 because I've heard for many it's a fan favourite amongst this series, and for such high praise, I feel I should have remembered the game more than I did. And now, well here we are. I finished up replaying God of War 2, and the question now is, after revisiting the game today, how well does it hold up over 14 years later, and is it worth your time revisiting or playing for the first time? Let's find out. God of War 2 is set 13 years after the events of the original God of War. After Kratos defeated Ares, he became the new God of War, and with this newfound power and strength, well, Kratos took his revenge on the gods for not taking away his nightmares and has been using his Spartan army to take over and destroy most of Greece. Athena attempts to warn Kratos that she cannot protect him for much longer from the wrath of Olympus, which Kratos ultimately ignores and descends upon the city of Rhodes to assist his Spartan army. All is business as usual until Kratos notices an eagle he believes to be Athena. The eagle zaps Kratos taking away his godly size and transfers that power to bring the Colossus of Rhodes to life to hunt and kill Kratos. Whilst battling the Colossus, Zeus offers Kratos the Blade of Olympus, the sword that Zeus used to win the Great War against the Titans. The catch with this sword is Kratos must infuse the blade with his godly powers, which renders him mortal, but lets him destroy the Colossus. All is well and good as Kratos defeats the Colossus, gloating about his victory before he ends up being squashed by the Colossus's hand and is left on death's door. Realizing the sword is his only salvation, Kratos slowly limps towards the blade as it's revealed that the eagle that stole Kratos' powers was actually Zeus and not Athena. Seeing Kratos barely clinging to life, Zeus offers him a final opportunity to serve the gods of Olympus which he refuses. This act enrages Zeus and so he plunges the blade of Olympus into Kratos, killing him. Luckily for Kratos, as he is being dragged into the underworld, just about to suffer eternal torment, he is saved by the mother of the Titans, Gaia, who offers the ghost of Sparta an alliance. Gaia tells the story of Zeus and how the Titan Kronos Zeus's father, ate all of his children in order to try and prevent a prophecy that one of his children would rise against him. Zeus's mother Rhea saved Zeus from Kronos and sent him away to an island that turned out actually to be Gaia. 
Gaia raised and nurtured Zeus until he grew into a man and that's when he sought vengeance against his father Kronos for his cruel acts towards his children. But because Kronos was a titan, well Zeus just waged war against all the titans and betrayed Gaia. The war ultimately won by the gods of Olympus, leaving the titans banished to the depths of Tartarus. This betrayal, humiliation and punishment is why the titans want Kratos' help in exacting their revenge. Kratos escapes the grasp of the underworld and Gaia tells him to seek out the sisters of fate who can alter time, prevent his death and allow him an opportunity at killing Zeus. Gaia sends the magical horse Pegasus to aid us in our journey and off we go. As we start flying towards the island of creation, we're attacked by a group of griffins and ravens, led by the Dark Rider. The Dark Rider succeeds in killing Pegasus, but Kratos doesn't go down so easy, as he jumps ship and kills both the Dark Rider and the griffin before he dives to the island below. The island of creation is where a lot of God of War 2 story takes place and sees Kratos encounter many foes, most seeking an audience with the Sisters of Fate, such as Theseus who guards the Steeds of Time, Perseus who has a neat shield we need, the Barbarian King who should have slayed Kratos if not for his plea bargain with Ares, the Gorgon Eurali and Icarus who has some wings that could come in handy. It's this fight with Icarus that leads Kratos to fall and land upon the Titan Atlas below the Earth. And Atlas isn't too happy to see him due to his imprisonment, but Kratos manages to persuade the Titan to help him, promising Zeus's death, and so Atlas returns Kratos to the surface. Back on the surface, Kratos defeats the Kraken and awakens the Phoenix, allowing him to fly towards the Temple of Fates, now driven even further by rage after learning Zeus is destroying his beloved Sparta as we speak. Once we finally reach the sisters though, our passage through to the past is denied, and so Kratos does what Kratos does. He kills the sisters of fate, and by gaining access to the loom of fate, Kratos can return to the point where Zeus betrayed him back at the beginning of the game. Kratos surprises Zeus, which saves his past self and reclaims the blade of Olympus. Kratos faces Zeus in battle, but after being stunned by a powerful lightning storm, Kratos fakes his surrender, allowing him to once again catch Zeus off guard and drive the blade of Olympus into Zeus, wounding the king of the gods. Athena begging Kratos to stop, which allows Zeus a chance to escape, and enraged still, he has one last crack at killing Zeus. Athena steps in the way, sacrificing herself to protect Olympus, and Zeus escapes. Kratos in shock asks why Athena sacrificed herself to save Zeus, and that's where she explains that Zeus was also trying to stop the prophecy of his son rising against him. That's why he killed Kratos, before he could kill him. Yes, that means Kratos is Zeus's son, and with her last breath, Athena pleads with Kratos to end his quest for vengeance. That was never going to happen though, and since he still has control over time itself, Kratos goes back in time once more to the Great War and brings all the Titans back to his time. The story ends with Kratos and the Titans climbing Mount Olympus, with Kratos seeking the destruction of the gods and Olympus itself to be continued in God of War 3. And that's the story for God of War 2. God of War 2's story is yet another example of why I don't understand how people just disregard this series' stories, because the story here is seriously amazing. Once again, the story centers around the central theme of revenge and the overarching objective of slaying a god, which, again, makes for an epic story premise, but because we already know Kratos' history by this point, God of War 2's story can focus a lot more on setting up this world and its characters, whilst also further fleshing out Kratos' character a little more, and it all culminates into a really fantastic story. I think the aspect I love most about the story this time around is the fact that the Greek mythology gets to properly stretch out its legs here. In fact, the whole plot's foundation revolves around the story of Kronos and how he devoured all of his children as soon as they were born to prevent the prophecy of one of his children overthrowing him like he did to his father. 
Kronos acted in fear and the consequences of said fear meant Zeus ultimately sought revenge against his father. That's the Greek myth and what I love about God of War 2's story so much is that it takes that story and expands upon it in a way that makes sense. Zeus betrays and kills Kratos out of that same fear that Kronos had which ultimately results in Kratos seeking revenge against what we learn to be his father. It feels like a natural cycle of events even though this is completely new and I love that. That's just the foundation though and Kratos interacts with so many great myths along this journey like the Titans, Gaia, Atlas and Prometheus to heroes such as Theseus, Perseus and even a mangled Jason of the Argonauts. An insane Icarus, the second oldest Gorgon, Euralee and the three sisters of fate. As a fan of the mythology, the attention to detail and just pure joy of seeing these characters is incredibly satisfying and engaged me so much more with the story this time around. Why the Kraken is here though, I do not know as that is a Scandinavian myth and why it climbs out of the ocean also puzzles me, but on the whole the myths are great. Another way God of War 2's story benefits from the original God of War is how they set up Zeus as the villain. You see, in the beginning of the game when Kratos is the God of War reigning chaos upon Greece, yeah, he let the power get to his head and you understand why Zeus would need to intervene. Maybe didn't need to kill him, but it is in keeping with how the gods tackle such issues as we saw with Ares. Do I understand why Kratos would seek revenge against Zeus? Absolutely. Kratos is my boy or dad as I said in the last video, but I also understand Zeus's actions and that makes for a great dynamic between the two characters. As the story progresses though, Zeus does become more of the villain with the final nail in the coffin being when he decides to destroy Sparta out of spite. This destruction of Sparta also leads me to Kratos' development in this game. Yes, he is still the angry man he was in the original and we know he doesn't care about much, but through this character storyline with the Spartan soldier, you see a much softer side to Kratos. We see that Kratos cares for his fellow Spartans for his men and upon learning that his city has fallen that extra layer of rage is visibly added to the ghost of Sparta which again makes Zeus the proper villain and shows Kratos to be a caring character who has now lost everything. This simple addition on top of what Kratos has been previously established as makes his character feel much more sympathetic and his rage at the end of the story understandable. In regards to the Sisters of Fate as well, I love that all the characters along the way on the Island of Creation have their own reasons for wanting an audience with the Sisters. Perseus wants to save a lost loved one. The last Spartan wants to bring back his destroyed city. The Barbarian King wants revenge against Kratos. Icarus has gone insane believing his trial is to cross the massive gap and Theseus, well, just wants to stop us. Whilst their stories are brief, they are intriguing and interesting and make for characters instead of just a boss fight. If I had to nitpick, I would say that Kratos could have time traveled to a bunch of different points in time to fix the future, like maybe before he killed his wife and daughter for instance, but I could see an argument for blind vengeance, so this isn't a huge issue for me personally. The ending is a bit of a cliffhanger as well, which is always rude at the time, but now is less important and it also doesn't mean the game didn't feel complete because it does. Overall though, I had a great time with God of War 2's story, which is pretty clear by this point. I mean, I can't really think of much I didn't like honestly. I think they implemented more Greek myths perfectly, they expanded on Kratos' character in a much needed way, made the surrounding cast more interesting, and the story on the whole felt much more consistent. God of War 2 greatly benefits from how in-depth the original God of War went with Kratos' character development, and it let the team at Santa Monica really build a world around the ghost of Sparta and what a world they built. Plus, I mean come on, that ending gets me frothing over the idea of playing God of War 3. Once again, God of War 2 just goes to show how solid a foundation the original God of War established because on the surface, the gameplay looks to be rather similar here in God of War 2. 
and yet it's so much better. As much as I loved the gameplay for the previous game, it had aged quite a bit in regards to combat with an over-reliance on too few combinations and weapons. But again, solid foundation, and God of War 2 only takes the fabled God of War formula to new heights with much needed improvements and additions. So let's break it down into segments, and first and foremost, we got to talk about the combat because it's still by far the biggest piece of the gameplay mechanics. Pie. At its core, the combat in God of War 2 is the same as the original, but what's been improved or added was sorely missed, and that is variety. Whilst there was various options present in the original, the combinations, weapons and magic abilities weren't balanced, which led to the basic square and triangle combos and Poseidon's Rage essentially being the combat, and that has been fixed in God of War 2. That's not to say the almighty square-square triangle combination has been nerfed, because in all honesty it's still a god tier combo, but they upped the effectiveness of the rest of the combinations making for a legitimate use for most if not all combos. For instance, the L1 combinations got a much needed buff, so now the Cyclone staggers weaker enemies making for great crowd control, the new Fury's attack is available right from the get go, it's super quick and great for smaller groups of enemies, Tartarus's rage is a great substitute for the god tier combo, especially with the heavier hits throughout, and just feels much more powerful. I wanted to highlight these combinations over others though, because when you level up any of your items, they are quite quite beefy in terms of cost, and in the original God of War, unlocking these combos just wasn't worth it because the base attacks were more viable, and this simple change of while making things balanced not only helps the combat feel fresher, but makes the reward of leveling up more exciting. The variety doesn't just stop at the combos though, because the Blades of Athena are just one of four weapons as well as four magic abilities. So not only are you learning what enemies are weaker or stronger against certain combinations, but now you need to think about the flow of an enemy encounter as well. You really have a lot of options to consider as the Barbarian Hammer is slow and lumbering but very powerful. The Spear of Destiny is much quicker and longest in range, the blades can whip around and have the most combinations, then you have the magic like Typhon's Bane, a rapid fire bow, Cronus's Rage which are orbs of electricity keeping enemies occupied for a time, the head of Euralee which is Medusa's Gaze 2.0, Atlas Quake which is God of War 2's Poseidon's Rage and a great AoE attack and you mix all these options in with a much improved blocking mechanic that incentivizes blocking at the right time as another form of dealing damage damage and you've got a combat system that is overflowing with potential combinations of attacks that makes the game's frequent enemy encounters feel fresh. Again, these various options don't matter if there isn't balance, and that's God of War 2's biggest improvement by far. I mean, just take Typhon's Bane for example. It is essentially God of War 2's Zeus's Fury, except it gets far, far more use because it's the first magic ability, doesn't use that much magic, and it's a quick range attack. It has a purpose like all these weapons, abilities, and combinations do. And with the constant feed of new enemies and combinations of enemies to encounter, you'll keep mixing it up throughout the game to optimize your attacks, which is really the aim. You want to get that combo meter as high as possible to try and gain greater rewards. And it's just far more satisfying to flow between attacks and avoid getting hit like you're death dancing around the arena. In terms of of smaller improvements, I'd have to say one, being able to turn Rage of the Titans on and off just makes sense and means you can activate it much more frequently, which is way more fun. And two, the quick time events are much easier on the controllers this time around. I don't think I mentioned it enough in the original God of War video, but my god, the Minotaur QTE in particular just felt like I was breaking my circle button at the speed I needed to go, and here in God of War 2 that has been addressed. It's just much more relaxed, which is very much appreciated. If I was to nitpick the combat, my only real gripe is that you can only have one other weapon equipped, and so if you need to swap out the hammer or spear for one another, then you need to pause and do so. 
Not a huge personal issue as the blades were still my bread and butter, but maybe could have been a weapon wheel prompt or something instead. The bosses are this series staple though, and whilst the original only had three bosses to fight, well God of War 2 at least triples that number depending on what you consider a boss. Quantity doesn't always equal quality, but in the case of God of War 2, it's a why don't we have both situation because I had a great time with each boss fight, even fights like the Dark Rider or Icarus, which is mostly quick time events, but the spectacle of these battles make them really enjoyable to experience. I'd consider those battles more mini bosses though, along with the Cerberus fight, so let's talk actual boss fights, and firstly, we've got to talk about the Colossus of Rhodes fight. The Colossus acts similar to the Hydra battle and has you progressing through the city encountering the Colossus at different junctions, until we ultimately defeat the Behemoth. The fight isn't really about each encounter and more the spectacle and culmination of the fight. As a tutorial boss, it's great. Each portion of the fight is nice and brief, helping the player either learn the controls or shake out the cobwebs, and it all culminates into going into the beast itself and destroying it from the inside. Next up we have Theseus, the famous Greek hero, and a pretty good fight that in my opinion gets knocked down a smidge due to the constant fleeing and minotaur waves. As a duel, I love this fight and it feels like Kratos is finally coming up against someone of equal skill. It's a fun battle, I just wish it was a true one-on-one -on -one battle given how cocky he is and the waves of Minotaurs do draw out the fight a little too long for my liking. But then again, in terms of mythology, it is cool to see him summoning the beast he's fabled for slaying and it is super satisfying to crush his skull in brutal fashion by the end. Next up is the Barbarian King, a multi-stage fight that begins with quick time events, transitioning into battling the Barbarian King on his horse, then one on one, and then as he summons armies from the dead for support. I love this fight for a few reasons, but probably most for its connection to the original game. Immediately we know who the Barbarian is, and they also bring back the ship captain in this fight, so as a fan of the original, it gets me invested straight away. But when you pair that with the spectacle of the fight's beginning, the multiple stages making this longer fight feel really well paced, and this may be a more personal thing, but I just like fighting against foes with big lumbering weapons. It makes me feel like a little assassin. Speaking of big and lumbering though, next is Medusa sister Eurali. This battle is intense, much like all the Gorgon battles are because immediately it limits your movement as you cannot be jumping around these enemies. That is doubly so for the Eurali fight though as she flash freezes you if you aren't careful but also has attacks best dodged with jumping so you need to be on your P's and Q's. Her boss fight feels like the biggest threat by far and is intense from start to finish, ending with a brutal beheading for our troubles. Next up is Perseus, a boss fight that is a good change of pace with some unique fighting parameters such as his invisibility and blinding attacks, but it just feels like Perseus is out of his league when battling Kratos, so not a personal highlight. This next fight I'm conflicted about though, and that is the last Spartan battle. Fighting someone unknown in a pitch black 2D arena is amazing and a great spectacle, but the fight itself can be boiled down to parry block for the win. This fight had a lot of potential but probably ends up being the weakest fight in the game in terms of bosses. Straight after this fight we encounter the Kraken which out of place or not is a great time. The fight centers around pushing the Kraken back enough to spear it with the bridge and to accomplish this the fight itself revolves around a few simple puzzle elements like making the Kraken raise its tentacle to access the button and be able to fly up and attack its face. Simple but effective. Finally we reach the Sisters of Fate which is a hefty battle to say the least. The first of three phases is against the sister Lachesis, as she mixes it up between melee and magic, requiring the player to learn attack tells, especially if you want to dodge her floor is lava attacks. Then we move on to the fight with Atropos, who is trying to destroy the sword from the original game. I don't like this phase very much, just because it 
really did drag for me. But it leads into Lachesis and Atropos teaming up, which is a great fight. You need to worry about Lachesis's usual attack switching between melee and magic, except without the lava floor, as well as keep an eye out for Atropos as she fires her own projectiles. I wish this final fight was the whole fight. The arena is a part of the battle and whilst the first fight with Lachesis is pretty good, that Atropos fight wasn't. Essentially being a drawn out ping pong match and yet when you pair up the sisters, it makes for a thrilling battle that ends with erasing them both from existence. Then we have a puzzle battle against the sister Clotho, which is a great breath of fresh air. You traverse the tower beginning at her feet and need to solve your way up to her head to drive a giant spike through it. Not the most challenging fight, especially once you get to the head, but it changes it up and for a boss battle against essentially an immobile creature, it's a good time. Lastly, we finally face off against Zeus. The first part of this fight is more so about fighting Cyrus which is sort of disappointing, but once Zeus shrinks to Kratos' size, it is an intense battle. Zeus deals a lot of damage, and you play hot potato with the blade of Olympus, meaning you need to make sure you are on your toes to switch up your playstyle on a dime. Not the best fight in the game, but a great final battle nonetheless. The bosses as a whole are great. Some better than others, and some you may like more than myself, but they're always great visual spectacles, and more often than not, a great fight as well. It's not all combat though, in fact, God of War 2 has a lot more moments of just platforming or just puzzles, which makes the game overall feel much better paced. I want to start with the biggest improver though, and that is the platforming. The platforming in the original God of War was good, but just centered around too much combat for me. And that has been fixed here in God of War 2. Not every wall has enemies spawn out of them. Fewer tight ropes to battle on. The balance beams are fewer and also quicker to traverse. The climbing and traversal is smoother. More platforming tests with puzzles such as with the Steeds of Time are great fun. And the new mechanic of swinging and gliding are all great improvements. I do wish the Icarus wings were unlocked a little bit earlier though, allowing for more platforming challenges. But as is, overall the platforming is just much much better here and same goes for the puzzles. The puzzles in God of War 2 are far more frequent and again as someone who isn't the best puzzle solver these act as a much needed longer break from combat usually and a few of these puzzles seriously stumped me. The puzzle involving Perseus's shield had me going around in circles before I questioned why I'd need a shield in the first place. Searching for some of the secrets involved more puzzle mechanics, some bosses felt like solving a puzzle, and with the new ability to slow down time, there is a ton of variety when it comes to these challenges of the mind over might. Personal favourites have to be the fight against the Colossus as you're inside his head, the Steeds of Time platforming puzzle, the Frozen Phoenix Room, forcing the translator to read the text before he jumps to his death is a short intense puzzle, and the Clotho fight to name a few. Overall, the gameplay for God of War 2 is just so much more balanced. The combat was injected with some great options and variety, which as a result fights off that feeling of repetition and flows much smoother. The bosses are plentiful and a great time to face and conquer, the platforming has been massively improved, and the puzzles are just a good time to solve. As anything, it's not flawless, but wow, is this game an absolute joy to experience from beginning to end. So, was God of War 2 a game I should have remembered playing? Absolutely. I have no idea why my mind blanked on this game so hard, but I'm glad I finally revisited it because this was an incredible experience. God of War 2 takes the foundation set in the original and just says, let me do that better. 
The story is captivating, the characters and world are so interesting, the combat is more various, flowing and brutal, the bosses are frequent injections of badass moments, the platforming is quicker and more fun, and the puzzles make you test your mind and break up the constant feeling of action. We're only two games into this series and I'm already reassessing where I'd rank certain games because I just enjoyed playing God of War 2 that much. I enjoyed it so much I'm going to make a bold claim and say it is the PlayStation 2's masterpiece. It's one of the console's best and a game I can easily recommend and urge anyone go out and play this game for yourself. I've been making retrospectives for almost two years at this point and I've started to notice a bit of a personal trend. I don't really cover the portable entries for any of these series when applicable, basically just a one and done after my not so great experience when revisiting Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate. This may lead you to believe I don't like these portable entries or don't care to cover them, which just isn't the case. I have a lot of nostalgia towards systems like the Nintendo DS and the PlayStation Portable and the wealth of games that accompanied them. So I'm not really sure why I skip over these experiences, but it changes now. I have too many fond memories playing God of War Chains of Olympus to skip over it. I played this game into absolute oblivion back in the day, replaying the game over and over and over again. I mean, it was a God of War game that I could take anywhere. The only thing at the time that would have topped it would have been if I could have done the same thing with Halo. Chains of Olympus just felt like a true God of War experience that was now on the go. I loved fighting the Persians since I just discovered 300 around this time. I have fond memories facing off against the bosses and I remember the story being a great time. So needless to say, I was excited to revisit God of War Chains of Olympus today. And well, here we are. It's been around 13 years in between playthroughs, but now that I've finished revisiting the game, the question is, how well does God of War Chains of Olympus hold up today? And is it worth your time revisiting or playing for the first time? Let's find out. The story for Chains of Olympus takes place about halfway through Kratos' 10 years of service to the gods of Olympus and begins with Kratos being sent to the city of Attica to help defend the city from the invading Persian army. Quickly after arriving, Kratos encounters the Persian army's pet basilisk and after wounding the creature, we make chase through the city to stop it for good. As we progress through the city, Kratos stumbles across the Persian king and after the king insults Sparta, well, he gets his head crushed for his troubles. After this brief distraction and possibly a further distraction, Kratos finally catches up with the basilisk and slays the beast once and for all. Much like in God of War 2, Kratos begins to gloat about his success before witnessing the sun fall from the sky as the world plummets into darkness. Yeah, he should probably learn to keep his mouth shut. Kratos follows the small source of remaining light to the city of Marathon and learns that Helios has fallen and Morpheus, the god of dreams, is quickly gaining power. After making our way through the city of Marathon, witnessing the power of Morpheus taking over the land, Kratos manages to reach the temple of Helios, the source of the only remaining light and the Sun Chariot. Before entering the temple, Kratos encounters Athena, who tells us that Helios has disappeared, and Morpheus has seized his moment and caused the gods to fall into a deep slumber. Naturally, Athena wants Kratos to find Helios, as only he can release Morpheus' grip on the other gods and reduce his power as she dangles the reward of ridding Kratos of his nightmares for further incentive. As we progress through Helios' temple, Kratos encounters Helios' sister, Eos, who informs the ghost of Sparta that the titan Atlas has escaped his bonds and captured Helios. Eos promises to convince Zeus to free Kratos of his nightmares and service, which he doesn't believe but still agrees. We manage to find the primordial fire needed to awaken the fire steeds and hop on the sun chariot to see where the steeds take us. 
The fire steeds fly straight into the underworld where they cannot go and leave Kratos to plummet into Hades' realm. On the river Styx, Kratos meets Karen, the ferryman, who warns the Spartan that it is not his time yet. Kratos doesn't listen though and after a brief confrontation, Karen knocks out Kratos and drops him into the hellscape of Tartarus. It's in this realm where Kratos discovers that we are definitely short one titan, as Atlas's chains are visibly broken, meaning someone has broken him free. But who would do such a thing? We manage to make our way back up to the River Styx now with a shiny new toy and defeat Karen and gain control over his ferry, which Kratos uses to follow the light illuminating the underworld, down the River Styx and coming upon the temple of Persephone. As we arrive at the temple, to Kratos' shock, he sees his deceased daughter Calliope playing her flute along the shores of the temple. Kratos follows his daughter into the temple, but we're always just a step behind, and eventually Kratos encounters Persephone, the queen of the underworld, instead. Persephone tells Kratos that Calliope is in the Elysium Fields and he can be with her again but only if he can rid himself of his past evils to become worthy of Elysium. She means for Kratos to give up his powers given to him by the gods, which he does without hesitation despite Persephone's warnings that this choice will doom the world. Kratos regains his humanity after transferring his power to the Forsaken Tree and is reunited with his daughter. And all's well that ends well. Obviously, this doesn't last long as, well, this is a prequel. Persephone quickly appears taunting and mocking Kratos for his decision as she reveals her master plan. Resentful for being betrayed by Zeus, tricked by Hades and abandoned by the gods, Persephone was the one who freed Atlas. She reveals that whilst Kratos was disarming himself, Atlas was carrying out her plan of destroying the pillar that holds up the world with the power of Helios, and tells us that she plans to kill everyone, including herself, to free her from her situation. Kratos realizes that this would mean not even Elysium is safe, and even if he stayed with Calliope, it would be short-lived. So as much as it pains Kratos, he casts aside his daughter, regains his power by slaughtering the souls of Elysium, and at Calliope's horror, returns to being the ghost of Sparta and pursues Persephone. Kratos catches up with Persephone at the world pillar, kills her and chains Atlas, forcing him to hold it up for eternity. Kratos rides the sun chariot back into the sky, pushing Morpheus's influence away, and that's the end of Chains of Olympus. Well, except for an end credit scene that really doesn't add too much, so yeah, that's the end of the story for Chains of Olympus. Now, first and foremost, is this the best story in the series? No, it's not. There are definitely problems here, especially the more you look at it from a critical viewpoint, but I do just want to say that in the moment, I had a good time with the story. I think the story's faults do come down to the much shorter runtime here. For comparison, God of War and God of War 2 took me around 9 to 10 hours to get through, and Chains of Olympus took me just under 4 hours. That's not a whole heap of time we're dealing with, and in a lot of aspects, it feels like that. The story just feels like it has a grand idea. I mean, you begin the game fighting off a Persian invasion, Helios has been taken, with the sun gone, Morpheus has swooped on the opportunity to be rid of the gods and take over, a titan has been set free from Tartarus, along with getting more context as to what sort of service Kratos was serving for the gods, and more character development shown with his interactions with his daughter, and how easily he can dismiss humanity for himself. All these puzzle pieces, in theory, could make for a truly epic story and adventure, and that's why, in the moment, the story is a great time. It's upon reflection where you realize these elements just don't get the time to properly stretch their legs, and it ends up feeling rushed. 
For being the main objective, it doesn't feel like you ever saved Helios. Morpheus is never seen, barely represented, and then abruptly thrown to the side for Persephone. I loved Kratos' moments with his daughter Calliope in Elysium, further showing a softer side to the ghost of Sparta. But laughable quick time event aside, how quickly Kratos can get his powers back and why he has to kill the souls to get them feels like the writers had written themselves into a corner. Why Persephone told Kratos her plans doesn't make a ton of sense either as he was none the wiser. They just missed out on a lot of potential in this story and I think they wanted to tell a story suited for a console experience but the portable nature hindered them a little bit. But I don't want this to all be negatives because I still think there is quite a bit to like here. Again, I do enjoy seeing Kratos' other emotions and seeing him interact with Calliope and ultimately break her heart as she witnesses his destruction is a great story touch. And this furthers his character as to why he becomes so fed up with the gods' promises. I love the new theme of betrayal and the central message of do not trust the gods which permeates through each character. Kratos is constantly betrayed by the gods who never fulfill their promises, Atlas locked away for being a titan, Persephone kidnapped and left to stay with Hades by the other gods, Charon a slave to the gods never to be set free, Helios betrayed by Persephone, even to a lesser extent the gods themselves betrayed by Morpheus. It's a consistent theme that isn't revenge for a change and it makes the story here feel unique. As has been the case with the rest of the series, I'm still a sucker for the mythology. I'm always intrigued and interested in regards to what new myths we'll get to see and interact with, and on a personal level, it will consistently keep my attention from beginning to end. Whether it be the basilisk, though it needs a few more feathers or rooster-like qualities, the Persian myths make an appearance with an Ifrit Jinn, a demon genie essentially, witnessing the stark contrast between Hades and the river Styx, to Tartarus and Elysium is amazing. Learning about Persephone, Charon and Helios, I just love to see this sort of stuff. Overall, in the moment, the story is a good time, but it's probably best to move on afterwards and not reflect and dissect it too much. I think all the pieces are here for a really amazing story. They just weren't able to piece the puzzle together and whether that was due to too grand a concept for a short portable title or just not knowing what to cut and what to expand on, I don't know, but it does end up being a solid story, just nothing great, which is unfortunate because I can really see the potential to be great here. Ready at Dawn's greatest accomplishment in regards to God of War Chains of Olympus is how well they managed to emulate the God of War console experience onto a portable device. Because the gameplay here in Chains of Olympus feels like a true God of War experience just with a portable mindset. Seriously, after going from God of War to God of War 2 and now Chains of Olympus, the gameplay didn't skip a beat. Obviously, you notice the portable additions to the formula to allow for a more stop and go style of system, like the plentiful save points and shorter combat encounters, for example. But at its core, this is a true God of War experience, and that is to be commended. But let's get into specifics, and of course, we've got to talk about the combat first. As always, the combat in Chains of Olympus is fluent, satisfying, and just plain fun. We know the basics at this point in the series, so I won't bore you with a retelling, and instead, I want to talk about the new additions and improvements, as well as the unfortunate back steps. In terms of Kratos' arsenal this time around, we have the tried and true Blades of Chaos, Gauntlet of Zeus, Efrit, Light of Dawn, Karen's Wrath, and the Sun Shield. Right off the bat, I want to say that the magic ability Light of Dawn I forgot existed until the very end of the game when I discovered it on accident. I think I must have looked away during the tutorial prompt or something, but I legitimately thought we just had the two magic abilities and two weapons. I just wanted to get that out of the way in the beginning because I don't have many thoughts on the ability, and that's why. As for the rest of Kratos' arsenal though, I loved what was on offer here. Effort is the new AoE ability with a Persian Demon Genie twist, and yes, it's Poseidon's Rage types of useful. Karen's Wrath is a really effective stun and almost 
boost a hold up or get to you in a minute ability, which is always helpful when trying to preserve combos, and the sun shield makes blocking and parrying just feel satisfying. The Blades of Chaos are the Blades of Chaos, again tried and true and a go to. But here in Chains of Olympus, they finally have a worthy competitor because the Gauntlet of Zeus is powerful yet quick an up close and personal weapon, yet can cover distance with ease, it just plain and simple feels great to use. So much so that I all but gave up on the blades after I unlocked the gauntlet because I just had a blast using this weapon. Obviously you are sacrificing a wealth of combinations and attacking from a distance when choosing to use the gauntlet as opposed to the blades, but man, the satisfaction of smacking around the enemies with the gauntlet just outweighs any drawbacks and makes for a great change of pace for me personally after going back to back to back with this series. In terms of the arsenal, it's all good stuff. Unfortunately, the combat itself does feel a lot simpler. For example, there are a few too many areas where you'll encounter enemies that can simply be defeated by a singular circle button press. I mean, just look at this elevator. Why even make this a combat encounter? Don't get me wrong, this isn't all the time and overall the combat is still enjoyable, but, and I know this comparison is unfair, but it was the last game I played, compared to God of War 2, it is a step backwards. Chains of Olympus feels much more like the original God of War. I noticed this primarily in the combinations with the Blades of Chaos because the basic square and triangle combinations once again just make the other combinations irrelevant. Square, square, triangle is once again king and this is frustrating because if they just added some invincibility frames towards the ends of the bigger combinations like the Cyclone or let me cancel out mid combo, then this isn't an issue and allows for more free flowing combat and actually makes me want to level up the blades to unlock more potential variety. On the nitpickier side, there are no real large encounters with a wealth of various enemies, but I do understand there would have been limitations for the hardware. The last section of combat also feels a bit rushed, like they copy pasted, so a bit of a bummer to end the game on. The camera can lead to more cheap shots off screen than I'd like, and for some reason, some of the barriers to progress didn't despawn upon finishing a battle for a little bit, leaving me just standing around waiting. As always though, the boss battles are what this series is known for, so how are the bosses in Chains of Olympus? They're pretty good. There's only four, but given the shorter runtime, that makes sense. The Basilisk and the Persian King are the tutorial bosses, with the Basilisk playing a lot like the Hydra battle in the original, as you encounter the beast at various junctions throughout Attica. And the Persian King being a great teaching tool for dodging with easy to avoid swings and attacks. They're great teaching tools to again either shake out the cobwebs for returning players or teach new players the ropes, and it's just satisfying for finishing a boss by crushing their skull or taking down a giant beast. Karen the Ferryman is probably my favourite fight in the game even though the first meeting is just waiting for him to knock you out. When the actual fight begins though, it's a great time and some attacks are pretty challenging to avoid. Karen's Wrath almost did me in a few times in this fight and I just love that sort of stress in a boss battle. It's quite a lengthy fight with Karen healing at various stages until you destroy all three pillars and after each pillar is destroyed, his attacks just get quite quicker. There is a lot of elements to this fight. Karen attacks with his scythe, Karen's wrath, the orbs that you can either dodge or throw back at him, but I'd get the practice of reflecting his attacks now because that's how you complete the fight after his death fake out. Karen's fight just has a lot of moving pieces, poses a good threat, and all in all is a pretty memorable fight for the series. Persephone is our final fight and reminds me a lot of the Lachesis fight from God of War 2, which isn't a bad thing at all. Her attacks have a quick wind up, she does a good chunk of damage, has unblockable attacks, mixes it up between melee and range attacks, has a lot of various attacks that you need to quickly learn and adjust to, and all in all this is a great battle. I do wish she took more damage from our attacks because it really feels like we're doing bugger all to her health bar at times, and I would also like if the sun symbol wasn't present during the second phase because every time I wounded her I thought I needed to use this and my game was just bugged. 
The second phase as well is more or less dodge the attacks until you can reflect her projectile and wound her, so I personally like the initial phase better. If I was to nitpick about the bosses, I don't think the number of fights is a problem, but when you have two at the beginning and more or less two at the end, well, why not space them out a little? That's really my only issue though, because I think the bosses here in Chains of Olympus are a good time. God of War isn't all combat though. Except, well, in Chains of Olympus it basically is. Yeah, the platforming definitely got the axe here and the puzzles are much fewer and further apart, so this section will be short. The mechanics are all here for the puzzles and platforming, but it's like they said, alright, we need to use everything, but we probably only have time to do it once. There is just the one balance beam with a cheeky trophy, just one swimming segment, one moving platform section, that sort of thing. The puzzles don't fare much better, in fact, I actually don't remember any except for the light reflection puzzle because it was really enjoyable. Aside from that, it's a lot of pushing blocks and picking up bodies, nothing all that special. Once again, I have been a little more negative than I expected in regards to the gameplay, but don't get it twisted, I had a lot of fun playing Chains of Olympus. It's clear though how the portable nature restricted some decisions and some elements do feel rushed, but at the end of the day, the combat is still a good time, the Gauntlet of Zeus is a badass secondary weapon, and the bosses are great battles. Not perfect, and my nostalgia may be coming out here, but I had a blast playing all these years later. So, was God of War Chains of Olympus as good as I remembered? No, it wasn't. I'll be the first to admit that it's got some drawbacks such as the story, basic combinations overpowering the unlockable combos, and not as much platforming and puzzles to mix it up in between combat. With all that being said though, I do have a lot of respect for Chains of Olympus because again, it needs to be stated, this was a portable God of War experience that felt like it could be on consoles. It's not the best game in the series, but by no means do I think this is a bad game. And if you're a fan of God of War, I don't see why you wouldn't enjoy Chains of Olympus as well. Five years after the release of the original God of War, this Greek mythology epic would conclude, at least in regards to the main trilogy, with the release of God of War 3 in March 2010. And wow, would it leave a lasting impact. I can still recall my first playthrough like it was yesterday, as my 13 year old self had his jaw permanently cemented on the ground from beginning to end. Concluding this epic tale of revenge, experiencing the fast, fluent, and violent combat, the brutality of the boss encounters, it all to this day has stayed with me. To a point where, as soon as God of War is mentioned, this is the game I think of. So needless to say, going into this retrospective, I was ecstatic. As soon as this series was voted in by my lovely subscribers, I was foaming at the mouth to revisit my favourite entry in one of my favourite series, as well as what I'd consider my favourite game on the PS3. But as per usual, it has been quite a while in between playthroughs, and as much as I want to believe my nostalgic memories are fact, I need confirmation, and so here we are. It's been 11 years since God of War 3 released, and despite my personal nostalgia, the question today is, how well does God of War 3 hold up today, and is it worth your time revisiting or playing for the first time? Let's find out. The story for God of War 3 continues immediately on from the end of God of War 2, with Kratos ascending Mount Olympus with Gaia and the other Titans to destroy the gods of Olympus. The Olympians immediately rush into battle, which sees Poseidon launch from Olympus, performing a death blow against the Titan Epimetheus, and then going on to manifest himself as a giant water being aided by several hippocampi or water horses. Poseidon and his seahorses begin to attack Gaia, trying to halt her progress up Mount Olympus, 
causing Kratos to engage in an epic battle against the god of the sea, drawing Poseidon into Gaia's grasp and launching through Poseidon's godly form, leaving only the god remaining. Now weakened, Kratos walks up to the fallen god and beats him savagely, leading to the most brutal use of the L3 and R3 buttons I've ever seen, and ultimately killing the god of the sea. Poseidon's corpse falls into the ocean below, and with his death, the sea levels rise, causing a flood to seemingly engulf the entire world, and destroying all of mankind that were unlucky enough to be below the top of Olympia. With Poseidon now out of the picture, Kratos returns to Gaia as they reach the peak of Olympus where Zeus is angrily awaiting his son. This meeting doesn't last long though as Zeus launches an almighty blast of lightning, blowing off a massive amount of Gaia's arm and sends both Kratos and Gaia falling down Olympus. Kratos attempts to save himself by digging his blades into the Titan as she begins to climb her way back up to Zeus. Furious, Kratos pleads for Gaia to help him, but she reveals that Kratos was just a pawn to serve the Titans' revenge against Zeus, and now that they've reached Olympus, they have no further use for him, refusing to save him and leading Kratos to fall straight down into the River Styx. Within the River of Souls, Kratos loses his blades and powers, weakening him upon his arrival in the realm of Hades. It's here where Kratos encounters the spirit of Athena, who claims to have reached a new level of existence, since he slayed her and is now willing to help Kratos seek his revenge against Zeus, despite dying to save him in the previous game, because she now sees a new truth. Athena grants Kratos the new blades of chaos to survive the underworld, and tasks him with the quest of extinguishing the flame of Olympus in order for Kratos to finally be able to defeat Zeus. But first we need to escape Hades. As we make our way through the underworld, encountering a few lost souls and finding the three judges of the underworld and the chain of balance, Kratos meets the spirit of a young girl he believes to be his daughter, Calliope. Though he is mistaken and the young girl is named Pandora. Pandora begs Kratos for his help, but he refuses and heads on his merry way. Soon after, we meet Hephaestus, craftsman of the gods, who is down in the underworld for a currently unknown reason. Kratos asks Hephaestus about the flame and is warned that it is a fool's errand, killing both man and god alike, which Kratos ignores, reclaims the blade of Olympus, and now it's time to take on Hades himself. Hades seeking revenge against Kratos over the deaths of Athena, Poseidon, and his wife, Persephone, attempts to steal Kratos' soul, which he ultimately fails, and so a battle begins. Hades and Kratos are evenly matched for a time until Kratos steals the claws of Hades and rips out Hades' souls and absorbs it, leaving Hades dead and releasing the souls of the underworld. On our way out of the underworld, we once again encounter Hephaestus, encouraged by Kratos' work so far, and asking for the Spartans' help in rescuing his daughter, Pandora, who was taken away when Hephaestus was banished to the underworld by Zeus. Again though, Kratos refuses this request despite Hephaestus' attempt at relating father to father. With Hades' soul, we use a Hyperion gate in the underworld which transports Kratos to the city of Olympia. And now back amongst the living, he is up against both the Titans and gods. Shortly after arriving, we catch up with a wounded Gaia barely hanging on to the side of the mountain, begging for Kratos' help, and in a sort of poetic justice, Kratos' response is to cut off Gaia's hand and let her plummet to the bottom of the mountain, presumably to her death. Whilst traversing the city of Olympia, Kratos shoots down Helios' chariot, defeats the titan Perses, finds the wounded god and removes his head from his body for a nice light source, which we'll need since the world has now plunged into darkness. A little further along our ascent, we are taunted by Hermes, who mocks Kratos for his past sins, and so we make chase up the chain of balance and conveniently straight to the flame of Olympus. 
Kratos discovers that the flame is holding Pandora's box within it, and Athena informs us that he never received the power from within the box, and that only with Pandora can he dispel the flames and reach the power within. Outside the chamber of the flame, we once again find Hermes finally catching up with him and amputate his legs, acquiring his boots, killing Hermes, which unleashes a plague upon the world. With these new boots, Kratos reaches an intoxicated Hera, who ignores his request for Pandora's location and instead summons Kratos' half-brother, Hercules. Hercules, jealous of all the attention Kratos has garnered from their father Zeus, and attacks us, which goes about as well as you'd expect. Skipping ahead a little further, and we stumble across Aphrodite, who is indifferent about the war on Olympus, and leads us back to her estranged husband, Hephaestus, through another Hyperion gate. Hephaestus is unwilling at first to allow Kratos to essentially burn Pandora to death, but eventually sends him out to Tartarus to retrieve the Omphalos Stone, claiming he can craft a new weapon for the Spartan capable of killing Zeus, but secretly hoping Kratos will die in Tartarus. Kratos finds his grandfather Kronos irritated over Gaia's death, attempting to eat Kratos, which allows us to get the Omphalos Stone from within the Titan and slay him on our way out. We return to Hephaestus, angry over the fact he was sent to his believed doom, but the craftsman sticks to his promise and crafts us a new set of blades called the Nemesis Whip. Hephaestus tries to electrocute Kratos, which backfires and leads to another dead god, as with his dying breath, he pleads for Kratos to spare Pandora, which he ignores. Continuing on further, we encounter Hera once more, drunk and engrossed in misery as she mourns the death of her children and the plants, taunting Kratos and calling Pandora a whore, leading Kratos to snap her neck in a blind rage, destroying all the remaining plant life. We finally reach Pandora's labyrinth, find its creator Daedalus strung up and delirious, believing Kratos to be his son, Icarus. We traverse the labyrinth, slay the giant scorpion, and finally find Pandora. They work together to escape the cube. Kratos plunges back down to Hades to destroy the chain of balance, allowing the cube to ascend to the chamber of the flame. Kratos has second thoughts about letting Pandora die to unlock the box, and in his indecisiveness, Zeus appears and holds Pandora hostage briefly before tossing her aside to duke it out with Kratos. We are seemingly victorious and try to stop Pandora once more, but when taunted further by Zeus, Kratos lets her go, unlocking the box within the flame. Unfortunately, the box is empty, and again, Zeus and Kratos duke it out, this time being interrupted by the still alive Gaia, who eats both Zeus and Kratos. Both of us fall to Gaia's heart, and Kratos impales Zeus with the blade of Olympus through Gaia's heart, killing the Titan, and apparently Zeus as well. Believing the job is done, Kratos lets his guard down, allowing Zeus's spirit to attack and leave us defenseless, attempting to replace Kratos' emotions of rage and anger with fear. Luckily, the spirit of Pandora guides Kratos back, this time equipped with the power of hope, I guess. And finally, Kratos slays Zeus once and for all with his bare hands, ending the reign of the Olympians. Athena congratulates Kratos on his long-awaited victory and requests that he turn over the power he claimed from Pandora's box, which he reveals that there was nothing inside. Athena doesn't believe Kratos, telling us she imbued the box with her own power of hope along with all the world's evils and demands this power back. Kratos rejects Athena once more, impaling himself with the blade of Olympus and unleashing the power of hope to whatever of humanity remains, which infuriates Athena as she leaves us to die. In a post credit scene, Kratos is missing from where he was last seen, with a trail of blood leading off the edge of the mountain, leaving the player to question where Kratos has gone. And that is where the trilogy concludes, and so the story of God of War 3. First of all, holy hell, there was a lot of story to go over here, and the first thought that comes to mind after all of this 
is what a conclusion. I mean, what an epic, badass, heart-pumping, pure, vengeance-fueled, enormous scale adventure we just went on. On its own, is it the best story of the series? No but it isn't on its own. As the final chapter, the ending of Kratos' story for now, I think they did a great job at captivating the player from start to finish. I'd say the story overall is probably the most simple of the trilogy, focusing more on just non-stop god-killing satisfaction instead of really fleshing out Kratos' character much further, except for some more fatherhood aspects and showing a caring nature amongst all the blood and guts with Kratos' connection with Pandora. That relationship is also set up really well and doesn't feel forced or rushed. They took their time to build this relationship and that's why despite how much Kratos wants Zeus dead, you understand why for a moment he almost chooses to save Pandora, further fleshed out by Kratos' guilt ever present for the loss of his own daughter. I think why I enjoyed the story so much though goes back to the constant praise I have for this series Greek myths, and getting to see and interact with Santa Monica's Greek universe, and in God of War 3 they really brought the big guns. We get an up close and personal look at the gods Poseidon and his Hippocampi, Hades, Helios, Hermes, Hercules, Hera, Hephaestus and Zeus, Titans like Gaia, Perses and Kronos, visit the hellscape of Tartarus, swim amongst the souls in the river Styx, witness the destruction this quest for vengeance is causing to the world with every god's defeat, and as a fan of the mythology it is seriously wet dream quality stuff. I love Santa Monica's twist on these incredible myths, like Hercules for instance is a real highlight with his jealousy towards Kratos, quickly briefing the player on what he's been up to in this timeline and just the pure feeling of strength he exudes, or the reason Hephaestus has fallen from grace in the eyes of Zeus being because Kratos poisoned Zeus's mind with fear after finding Pandora's box due to Hephaestus hiding it poorly on Kronos. Even just in general, Hephaestus gets a lot of screen time allowing his character arc to get properly fleshed out and makes him the one god I did feel a little bad for when slaying, even though you know, don't mess with Kratos. Giving the player an explanation as to why the gods turned on Kratos so heavily after the original game and tying it to opening Pandora's box makes sense as well, and thankfully they did this because the shift in attitudes was a little strange without this explanation. These little details and twists on the mythology not only hooks me into the story here, but makes me want to learn more outside of the game, which is an aspect of the series that I truly do love. As much as I love the simplicity of this story though, and the pure destruction of this tale of revenge, I did notice quite a few plot holes this time around that whilst didn't hamper my enjoyment of the story, still were noticeable. For example, Kratos not believing he has the power to kill a god and being disheartened at the empty Pandora's box is a bit of a stretch considering, well, by that point we've killed any god who has stood in our way. I'm willing to suspend my disbelief in regards to Zeus maybe having some sort of power, but still, this seems like a strange plot device for a game centered around slaying gods throughout. This one isn't as big of a deal, but... Kratos kills Persephone before the original God of War, and Hades didn't seem to have an issue then, so why, why now, you know? We also aren't really given an explanation in regards to Athena's new so-called higher being, and the fact that she was willing to die for Zeus, and then so quickly after help Kratos kill him, is another odd story decision. Don't get me wrong, these are issues in the story, but again, they didn't bring down my overall enjoyment. It isn't the greatest of stories on its own, but as a conclusion to Kratos' time within the Greek myths, it is captivating stuff. In a lot of ways, the story here is most comparable to a popcorn action movie. Non-stop action, giant set pieces, and just pure excitement driving the plot forward, and the story does a great job at emphasizing just how destructive Kratos is being in his quest for vengeance. 
and by the end, you get the feeling Kratos is finally close to forgiving himself for his past sins, but not before he completes his quest to kill Zeus. The story here in God of War 3 may not be the most complex, but it is thoroughly enjoyable and will hook you in from beginning to end and concludes the story for now brilliantly. When it comes to the gameplay of God of War 3, the mantra of if it ain't broke, don't fix it strongly applies. Where this may be a negative for some, it's not an issue for me at all, which is saying something given I'm playing the series back to back. The gameplay still revolves around the same formula, but it just feels like the best version of the God of War formula in my opinion. But this claim has no merits until I explain myself, so as always, Let's break it all down. The combat for God of War 3 is smooth as butter. It's fast paced, fluent, various and violent. As I said though, it doesn't stray too far from what we've experienced so let's talk new additions. Kratos has access to 4 weapons, 4 magic abilities, 1 per weapon and 3 more items further adding to your options in combat. The Blades of Exile are a series staple, but here they whip around effortlessly, have a good chance of stunning enemies, feel like they pack a good punch, and have the best magic ability in the army of Sparta, which, as the name implies, sees Kratos summon his fallen Spartan brothers to form a protective barrier around him. Launching spears and through upgrades end up also launching a barrage of arrows around the arena. The Claws of Hades acting similarly to the Blades of Exile but can release souls to attack enemies as well as the Soul Summon magic ability that allows you to pick between enemy souls to summon and attack. The Nemean Cestus are two-handed gauntlets that pack a massive wallop and the Nemean Roar ability acting as a shockwave. The Nemesis Whip once again very similar to the Blades of Exile but having the benefit of electricity and have a noticeable speed increase with the Nemesis Rage ability that shocks surrounding enemies. Then we have the Bow of Apollo, the Head of Helios and the Boots of Hermes that act similarly to magic abilities but recharge on the downside of being more stun or range abilities as opposed to big damage dealers. Lastly, we once again have a Rage Meter, this time called the Rage of Sparta, in which Kratos uses the Blade of Olympus. First things first, yes, it is a little disappointing to have three weapons so similar to one another. As much as I enjoy using the Claws of Hades and the Nemesis Whip, when you stack them up against the Blades of Exile, they do end up losing out more often than not because of the Army of Sparta ability being the best magic ability by far compared to summoning an enemy briefly or shocking enemies on top of the fact I know how the Blades of Exile work and what combinations to use in what situations more so than the new Blade weapons. That's not to say I never used the new Blades though because as I said this is now my fourth game of the series in a row and I did want to check out the new toys. I enjoyed the oomph of the Claws of Hades, smacking down on enemies creating a small area of effect with floating skulls seeking enemies. I actually used the claws quite a bit, I just wish the magic ability was a little better as the summons AI more often than not seems to miss enemies. I love the speed of the Nemesis Whip, it's got great potential to stun lock enemies with an attack you can hold down, and the shock magic ability isn't too shabby either, making for a good potential option in combat, but again very similar to the Blades of Exile. The Nemean Cestuses though are by far my favourite weapon of the game. These bad boys pack a massive punch, pun intended, and they act very similarly to the Gauntlet of Zeus from Chains of Olympus. It's powerful and somewhat limited in range compared to the Chain Blades, but through levelling this can not only be improved, but they cover ground really well, and with the Shockwave stunning enemies they make for a great competitor to the Blades of Exile. And it's a weapon you need to use against specific enemies, so it's just best to have them handy regardless. In regards to the items, the Bow of Apollo is probably the most frequently useful with explosive barrels, a quick rate of fire for ranged attacks, and a flame charge, but I also quite like the Head of Helios and blinding massive groups of enemies. 
The boots weren't an item I used much though, as with the new addition of grabbing enemies and charging them around the arena into other enemies, well, it serves a similar purpose, but I have less control with the boots. There is a lot of potential variety here in God of War 3's combat, and all these options flow seamlessly together. Swapping between weapons, launching attacks and combinations with one weapon, and continuing on with another, using the magic abilities, items, along with the ability to launch Kratos over to an enemy to continue a combo, it makes for, again, a fast-paced and fluent experience that makes the combat so much fun, especially when mixing in the Rage of Sparta, and the finishing moves with the button prompts taking up less of the screen, making the player use their peripheral vision for these button prompts and letting you focus on the violence you're causing. God of War 3 is where the bosses truly came to play though, and there's a lot of them to go over, so let's not waste time. Like the series so far, God of War 3 begins with a boss battle. It just so happens this time though, it's against the God of the Sea himself, Poseidon, accompanied with his Hippocampi. And what a battle to begin the game. First of all, the setting for this battle being on Gaia means the arena is constantly moving and changing. One minute Kratos is grounded and the next he's dangling from Gaia's arm. The battle against just the Hippocampi are much like the Hydra and Basilisk fights and act as a great tutorial boss battle, initially not posing much of a threat letting players come to grips with their controls and systems at play until we progress further and face off against both Poseidon and his pets. I really love this portion of the fight as you smack at the claws of the Hippocampi, gripping on Guy's head, launching up at a pinned Poseidon, and having a lot more to worry about in regards to his attacks. The fight culminates in an epic traversal QTE leading to a once again brutal eye gouge prompt as the camera switches from first to third person to truly demonstrate the violence. And that's Poseidon, done. As a tutorial fight, there is a great balance here between learning and actually having a boss battle that poses a threat. Poseidon's attacks can deal a hefty amount of damage and having the fight end the way that it does just oozes satisfaction. But it teaches the player a lot of much needed mechanics as well. Next up we have Hades and I love this fight. Due to Hades size, despite the seemingly large arena, it actually comes across quite claustrophobic and since his attacks are rangy and smack the ground with great power, yeah it doesn't feel like you're dealing with a lot of room which makes for a real feeling of tension. The longer the fight goes on and the more you weaken Hades though, the more this feeling is emphasised with more projectile attacks, attacks from underground, summoning Cerberuses and all of this leads to an interesting little tug of war battle over a chasm into the river Styx. This is where we ultimately steal his claws and Hades quickly reappears from the dead, leading to the final phase surrounding an even smaller arena, dodging attacks taking up most of said arena and swinging around back to deal damage before ultimately stealing the god of the underworld's soul. Again, badass conclusion to the fight which is very much a common theme, but just overall a true highlight amongst the bosses. The constant feeling of tension, the big damage Hades can deal whilst acquiring a new weapon and trying to learn how to use it on the fly and despite already slaying a god, just the more one-on-one -on -one nature of this fight makes for the first true god slaying moment and this is all good stuff in my books and makes for one of my favourite fights in the series. Next up is Helios which isn't really a boss fight at all, but does have a badass beheading and a unique block the light segment, and he's a god, so what the heck, I thought I'd include him. Hermes is in a similar boat to Helios, but the fight is more so a chase revolving around platforming, which I really did enjoy. It's a great breakup in the pace for the bosses and shows the player that not every god will be this epic battle, which fits the mythology. Hermes does have a brief battle with Kratos which isn't the best if I'm honest as he just dashes around hoping to hit us but again that conclusion is just worth everything as we amputate the god's legs. Next up we're back to the actual battles as we face off against Hercules. 
The initial phase is just battling minions, so nothing too special to begin with, but once Hercules comes down himself, the fight truly begins. Hercules is a slow and lumbering sort of foe, but as his strength implies, he packs an absolute smack. Once we steal the Nemean Cestus from Hercules, he fights alongside his minions, but ultimately gets his face pounded into oblivion in another brutally gratifying ending. This fight is alright. Not the best, but Hercules does pose a threat here. I just wish his attacks varied a little more, and he didn't telegraph said attacks so heavily to make for a more tense battle. Next is the battle against the Titan Kronos, which is more of a set piece than an actual boss fight, as it consists on Kronos, but has you battling the standard enemies leading to you impaling Kronos through the chin with his own harness. I do enjoy this encounter quite a lot, and they do a great job at highlighting just how massive the size difference is between Kratos and his grandfather. I just wish there was more actual battling with the Titan. Hephaestus isn't really a boss either, but he's a big god who ever so briefly we battle, so I thought I'd chuck him in here too. Next is the battle against Scorpius, the giant scorpion queen who guards the labyrinth. This is a fight that requires the use of the Neme Incestuses, so immediately I'm a fan, but this is a pretty basic fight. Smack at the legs, Scorpius gets stunned, wail on her, rinse and repeat until death. Bit average. Finally we have the battle against Zeus, and again, this is one of my favourite fights in the whole series. I remember this fight being a real challenge back in the day, so to my surprise, the initial phase isn't too bad. The same strategy as the last Spartan applies in this phase, so you best be good with your parries by this stage, but Zeus's various attacks both aerial and ground base are no joke, and he packs a serious punch, so you need to find openings to attack and be ready to either block or dodge at a moment's notice. The second phase is brief, more of a wait until Gaia eats you both, but the third phase is where that memory of challenge was legit, because this is stressful. Zeus is quick, there isn't a lot of opportunities for more health and magic, Zeus will duplicate himself, and if you're not careful, he'll heal himself as well. I love this phase because it's tense, it's a true challenge, and it honestly can feel overwhelming at times, but learning his attack patterns, Again, utilizing the parry function, saving your magic for the right moments, and when it's all said and done, it makes impaling him all the sweeter. The final phase of the fight takes a first person perspective as we smash the king of the gods into a bloody mess. Overall, the bosses are a great time here. There are some fights that whilst aren't the best battles, they are visually an absolute joy to experience, and fights like Hades and Zeus just elevate the series to a new level. And after the journey we've been on with Kratos up to this point, it's awesome to see how deep his vengeance runs, and how blinded by revenge he truly is. As always, the combat isn't everything God of War has to offer, and like in God of War 2, God of War 3 has more moments of just platforming or just puzzles that help make the game feel a lot better paced. The platforming is some of the best of the series. There is a lot more platforming challenges from the very beginning, and that's because we have access to the Icarus wings from the jump. We also now have the ability to grapple and hang off the harpies to make it across larger gaps, the Hermes boots allowing us to wall run, though this is only for specific walls. The biggest new addition to the platforming though is the fly challenges. Similar in concept to the Pegasus riding from God of War 2, but this is a pure adrenaline rush. These sections see Kratos travelling at blistering speed, usually have falling boulders to look out for, as well as trying to squeeze through tight openings, and they are so much fun. They aren't too frequent, which makes these sections feel unique, and due to the mix of challenges and tension with the fast-paced nature, they're an absolute blast, and a real highlight when the game is all said and done. In regards to the tried and true platforming of the series, well, you know what to expect there, except there are zero planks to walk on this time around. Again, a highlight has to go to the Hermes chase as the integration between boss and platforming challenge and the tension of trying to save Pandora is down to the wire sort of stuff, which is all good fun. The puzzles aren't too different than what we've come to expect, but the challenge does seem to have gone down a smidge. 
Maybe I've just played this game more recently or more often, but I didn't get stuck at all here, and that's saying something as I'm not the quickest at seeing most solutions. That doesn't mean I didn't enjoy the puzzles though, because I had a great time here as well. I loved puzzles like Hera's Maze as it constantly messes around with perspective and time-based challenges, the room with the various portals and a single ballista with many hidden secrets, and the many puzzles within the labyrinth are all great stuff, and with the improvements to movement with blocks, it makes for much faster paced puzzle solving. The music minigame is strange though, I must say, sort of takes me out of the moment. Overall, the gameplay for God of War 3 for me just feels like the ultimate experience in the series. The combat is incredibly fast paced with a ton of options to play with and mix it up. The bosses are massive in scale, making for visual marvels and fights like Hades and Zeus are some of the series best battles. The platforming is so much fun and makes secret hunting a breeze and the puzzles, whilst not too challenging, are still enjoyable to solve. I was hooked from beginning to end and once it was all said and done, I was ready to go back for more. I just think the gameplay here is the series best when taken in as a whole. So was God of War 3 as good as I remembered? Finally I can answer. Yes, it was. God of War 3 continues and concludes Kratos' chapter within the Greek myths in an epic fashion. The story hooked me in from start to finish, the combat is so gruesome and filled with potential variety that makes it constantly feel fresh, the boss battles are frequent injections of absolute brutality, the platforming is such a joy and the puzzles, again, help break up the action and pace the game out more as a whole. God of War 3 is still my personal favourite game in the series. It's still one of my favourite games on the PlayStation 3 and I can honestly say if you could only play one game from the series, I'd say you need to play God of War 3. It has some problems as does any game and some elements have been done better in other games in the series. But as a whole product, this is my ultimate God of War experience. 2010 was a big year for my fellow God of War fans. With the conclusion of the main trilogy releasing in March, many fans were left to ponder what would be next for the Ghost of Sparta. Where do you go from here? Well, we didn't have to wait long to get our answer with the announcement and release of God of War Ghost of Sparta in November for the PlayStation Portable. I was unbelievably hyped to get my hands on Ghost of Sparta back in the day as I love Chains of Olympus and well, more God of War wasn't a bad thing. I still remember getting it for Christmas, popping it in my PSP, smashing it out that day and absolutely loved it. As a fan of Chains of Olympus, Ghost of Sparta was just a great improvement on the handheld God of War formula whilst adding an interesting bit of backstory to Kratos. But I didn't play this one as much as I replayed Chains of Olympus for some reason. And in all honesty, I can't remember too much about God of War Ghost of Sparta today. This always gets me excited though when revisiting games because it's a chance to fully re-experience a game and if it's good, great. And if not, well, probably explains why I forgot about it. So now that I've finished revisiting God of War Ghost of Sparta, the question is, how well does the game hold up today and is it worth your time revisiting or playing for the first time? Let's find out. The story for Ghost of Sparta is set after the events of the original God of War, but before God of War 2. Kratos has taken Ares' place as the God of War, but although he was now amongst the Olympians, he was still haunted by visions of his mortal life. These are not the visions we have become accustomed to though, this time centering around Kratos' childhood. Now the story here does revolve around these visions much like in the original God of War as you progressively learn more and more information. So for the sake of the synopsis, let's get it all out there now. Through a series of flashbacks we learn that an oracle foretold the fall of Olympus but not at the hands of the Titans, and instead by a mortal marked warrior. Zeus and Ares believed this marked warrior to be Kratos' brother, 
Demos due to his odd birthmarks. Ares seized a village in Sparta with Athena during a childhood training session between Kratos and Demos, and the two gods kidnap Demos. Kratos attempts to stop them but is brushed aside by Ares, leaving him with a nice scar, but before Ares can kill Kratos, Athena steps in telling Ares they just came for the marked warrior, pleading to not take the other boy's life. The two gods leave with Demas, taking him to the Domain of Death, which sees Demas tortured and imprisoned by the god of death, Thanatos. In honour of his sibling, Kratos marked himself with his iconic red tattoos identical to that of his presumed dead brother. These visions have haunted Kratos for years and so he decides against Athena's wishes to begin to explore his past and travels to the Temple of Poseidon, located in the city of Atlantis. A sea monster known as Scylla attacks and destroys Kratos' ship off the coast of Atlantis before he managed to drive the monster off and through a series of battles throughout Atlantis, finally slay the beast. Kratos reaches the Temple of Poseidon where he finds his mother Callisto, who after years of secrecy, attempts to reveal his father's identity, before suddenly transforming into a hideous monster. Kratos is forced to fight his mother and before she dies, thanks him and urges Kratos to seek out Deimos in Sparta. Before we leave Atlantis, Kratos meets and frees the Titan Thera, which ends up causing Atlantis to sink. Whilst escaping the city's destruction, Kratos encounters the Gravedigger, who warns the Spartan of the dangers of alienating the gods. Whilst travelling through the Aronia Pass, Kratos meets and ultimately slays Thanatos' daughter, Erinus, and arrives in Sparta, where he is lauded by the people. On our way to the Temple of Ares, we witness a group of Spartans led by the last Spartan from God of War 2, tearing down a statue of Ares in order to erect one of Kratos. Whilst in the jails of Sparta, Kratos chases down a dissenter loyal to Ares who attempts to kill Kratos by releasing the Piraeus Lion. Of course, this doesn't go well for the dissenter as Kratos kills both the lion and after the most serial killer walk ever, the dissenter as well. Once Kratos reaches the Temple of Ares, he encounters the spirit of his child self where he learns that he must now return to the sunken city of Atlantis and find the domain of death. Before we leave, the last Spartan hands Kratos his former weapons used during Kratos' time as captain of the Spartan army, the Arms of Sparta, and we return to the sunken Atlantis. Poseidon berates Kratos for sinking his beloved city, and we enter the Domain of Death. Kratos finds and frees his imprisoned brother, but Deimos is less than thankful. Enraged, Kratos failed to rescue him sooner, vowing to never forgive him. Deimos attacks and overpowers Kratos, but Thanatos intervenes and takes Deimos to the site where Kratos attempted suicide. Kratos saves Deimos from falling to his death and now grateful, the two brothers team up to take out Thanatos. It's at this point when Thanatos realises that Ares had chosen the wrong brother all those years ago, and instead, as we all know, it should have been Kratos. Thanatos kills Deimos in battle, but is soon after destroyed by Kratos. Kratos mourns the loss of his brother, remarking that he is finally free, and places Deimos in his grave, dug by the Gravedigger. Athena begs for forgiveness, offering Kratos a chance at full godhood, but Kratos ignores her and returns to Olympus, promising that the gods will pay for this. The game fades to black with Athena whispering, forgive me, brother, and a post credit scene shows the Gravedigger placing Callisto in a grave beside Deimos, with a third grave still to be filled, as he states, now only one remains. And that's the story for Ghost of Sparta. Immediately this story comes across as a big improvement over the one told in Chains of Olympus. It feels like Ready at Dawn learned a lot more about telling a story in a portable platform because where Chains of Olympus felt like they had to cut short a potentially epic story, here in Ghost of Sparta the story is a lot more simple. 
It doesn't feel cut short and because of that the story obviously feels more complete. I really enjoyed the story presented here despite some issues I'll touch on in a minute. I love learning more about Kratos' past and why he has become the man we experience today, and simultaneously seeing a kinder or softer side to the ghost of Sparta amongst all the death and destruction. Moments like when Kratos is comforting the injured Spartan who encounters Eranus shows just how much he cares for his people. As with all that has gone on in Kratos' life, the Spartan army is really his only remaining family. When Kratos finally finds Deimos, he allows him the chance of killing him, as he will not slay another family member and would rather die, and that is further shown when Kratos is carrying his fallen brother's body. As despite his best efforts, he ultimately failed to save his brother, leaving him all alone in this world. These moments add further depth to Kratos that personally I really appreciate and Ghost of Sparta if nothing else just adds further explanation and backstory behind his fuel for vengeance. It's not all niceties though and when Kratos wants to he is straight up psychotic almost as if the power is beginning to go to his head. The way he deals with the dissenter or King Midas isn't overly graphic but very eerie. More so than usual to a point where it doesn't feel like vengeance and more so a power fantasy. As per usual, the myths behind the story and how the developers interpret them into this universe is always going to grab my attention. And to see lesser known gods and locations amongst the long awaited introductions is great stuff as always. Gods like Thanatos whilst I have my issues with in terms of the story are great to see here as the personification of death which many would assume to be Hades and his own realm in the domain of death is very dark and depressing like it should be. Further showing the gods displeasure through Poseidon's interaction and disdain for Kratos after sinking Atlantis, the tale of King Midas and just how depressing his depiction in Ghost of Sparta is amazing. Having Kratos be responsible for sinking Atlantis is a great touch, the Piraeus lion being a landmark in reality and turning it into a real creature and boss is interesting along with including real Greek cities and locales like Sparta, Heraklion, the island of Crete, the Methanite Volcano and the Mounts of Aronia and Laconia are all great inclusions that ground this world into reality and that's something I can always appreciate. It's not all sunshines and rainbows though as unfortunately there are still some aspects to this story that simply don't get explained or make sense. For example Ares, Zeus and Thanatos not simply killing Deimos originally? Zeus says at the end just one remains like this was the plan all along but if they wanted Deimos dead why not have done that in the first place? If we're in the domain of death shouldn't Hades realm be close enough that Kratos could go there to get Deimos back after death? How come Thanatos saves Kratos from Deimos? And then why does he leave Deimos dangling instead of again just killing him right there? Why does Deimos have weapons and Deimos despising Kratos is understandable. So when he does a 180 so quickly and joins forces with Kratos, it's odd to say the least. There's just a lot of questions I was left with once the game was all said and done that despite believing this to be an improvement over Chains of Olympus, it does still feel less complete than I'd like. I mean Thanatos in particular does feel like this big bad guy for the sake of it instead of a true villain. Overall despite these issues again in the moment this is all a good time to experience. I do recommend not thinking about all of this too much though because the story can unravel itself. I still think the story adds enough to Kratos' past and backstory, adds interesting Greek myths into the mix and the journey to death's domain is filled with great moments. It's an improved story in my opinion over Chains of Olympus but it's good rather than great which it definitely had the potential to be. When you're dealing with such a short runtime though of just under 5 hours I think simple was the way to go and if nothing else adding further fuel to Kratos' vengeance is enough to grab my attention from beginning to end.
It still amazes me how well Ready at Dawn managed to emulate the console God of War experience onto a portable device, and Ghost of Sparta just improves on the foundation established in Chains of Olympus, except where that game felt much more like the original game, here Ghost of Sparta plays more like God of War 2, which I shouldn't have to tell you is already a great improvement. So let's just jump straight into it and as always we need to start with the meat and potatoes of the series, the combat. The combat here in Ghost of Sparta feels right at home with the rest of the series, but by this stage we all know how the core of God of War's combat works so let's talk the new additions, which I'll be honest isn't a whole lot. We have the tried and true Blades of Chaos or Athena, the new spear and shield combo with the arms of Sparta, Theris Bane which inflames the Blades of Athena in regards to weapons, and the Eye of Atlantis, Scourge of Aranus, and Horn of Boreas in terms of magic. There is no rage meter this time around for some reason, but Theris Bane somewhat replaces it, so not too big a loss. Immediately, it doesn't sound like a lot of options, and... Well, it isn't. In all honesty, Ghost of Sparta's combat is lacking a bit of variety this time around, especially considering the lack of balance between the weapons and abilities. For instance, as much as I love the fact that they finally brought in the iconic Spartan shield and spear, they simply aren't as useful as the blades. With the new addition of Thera's Bane, along with enemies only able to be damaged by the flame attack, it's just more convenient and effective to have the blades ready to go. Don't get me wrong, the arms have their uses, with the ranged attack and ability to block and attack simultaneously, but they just don't have the variety of combos or damage output like that of the blades. And I think the developers even acknowledged this by giving the arms to Deimos in the final fight, knowing the player wouldn't mind losing them. Same goes for the magic ability Horn of Boreas, as whilst again it has its uses with freezing enemies, it's just for too short a time, leaving the player to go to the Eye of Atlantis' shock charge and the incredibly useful Scourge of Aranus that floats around the combat arena hurting enemies and giving health back to the player. The Eye and Scourge are just a more worthwhile use of your magic bar, leaving the Horn rarely used, at least personally. You also have in this portable medium less variety in terms of enemies as well, which I don't believe I touched on in Chains of Olympus, but that can lead to the combat feeling rather samey as well. After saying all of that though, I'm not saying I didn't enjoy myself with the combat this time around, because I still had a lot of fun for many of the same reasons I've stated throughout the series. The game still has a good flow to it, the blades feel great as always to whip around and cause a beautiful chaos dance with, the Scourge of Aranus is a top tier magic ability out of the whole series, the Eye of Atlantis is a worthwhile competitor to the Scourge, and since you get it first, it has time to level up and properly compete at a max electric power. Thera's Bane is a great new mechanic, allowing for more frequent damage buffs than the rage abilities, and the arms are a super unique weapon that whilst not the best competitor, are something new for the series which is appreciated. It all still feels like a good God of War combat experience, and it's important not to forget this isn't the first game in the series to have irrelevant feeling options. Overall, the combat may not seem like it, as I've gone over the good to the combat of this series over and over at this point, but the tweaks, changes, and additions such as the God of War 2-like combat is a sizable improvement over the Chains of Olympus experience, which was pretty good to begin with. On the nitpickier side, the camera is still somewhat a problem. They didn't quite nail the tracking for it, but for the most part, it isn't too big an issue. The bosses are what this series is known for though, and here in Ghost of Sparta, they're a pretty good time with six bosses overall, and are much more evenly spaced out, which is an improvement from Chains of Olympus. They aren't the most challenging battles, I must say, but still good fun. As is tradition, the game begins with a boss fight, this time around with Scylla, which in terms of the actual boss fight plays very similarly to the Hydra battle and looks a little too close to the Basilisk. 
Scylla and Kratos' mother Callisto both act in very much a tutorial fashion, so they are just battles mainly focused on brushing out the cobwebs or teaching new players the controls, but in their own ways. The Scylla fight is where you're getting used to the mechanics with a big target to practice on, whereas Callisto is more similar to the one-on-one -on -one battles or fights against enemies like the Cyclops, so it's a nice way to ease the player into using dodge rolls, parries and finding openings to attack. I enjoyed both fights personally. The Scylla battle is this lengthy tango with great set pieces to accompany it and it always feels good taking out these behemoth bosses although maybe a little too similar to previous battles in the series. And Callisto hits with a good amount of force and can stun you if you aren't careful but overall basic enough in terms of attacks to memorize and avoid whilst capitalizing on your openings. Next up we have the battle against Thanatos' daughter Erinus, which is Ghost of Sparta's first proper boss battle. Erinus is probably the most challenging boss in the game, which isn't saying too much, but because we don't have access to the Scourge of Erinus yet, for obvious reasons, this fight isn't as much of a cakewalk. Erinus is quick, she darts around the arena, can drag Kratos into a void that stun locks us, fires quick projectiles and summons birds to act as a brief distraction from her attacks. After this first phase, Erinus transforms into a giant bird, which is a great set piece whilst not the most gameplay oriented. And a free falling segment which again, not too much to do but still a great set piece. Erinus is probably my favourite fight in the game because again we don't have all our overpowered tools yet, she has various attacks, poses a real threat which makes for an engaging battle that stands out amongst the rest and it all culminates into one hell of a set piece. Next is the Piraeus Lion which doesn't really feel like a boss if I'm honest as it seems like a reskin of another enemy doesn't take too long to slay and doesn't have too many attacks to worry about. This boss is after you unlock the Scourge of Erinus though and again the ability is just too good. Not an unenjoyable battle but not too memorable unfortunately. After this we have our battle with Deimos which in concept is a dope idea having an opponent who should in theory be as tough as Kratos. That isn't how it pans out though as again the Scourge does work his attack tells are a little too obvious and despite owning him in the fight, he wins, which just makes it all feel a little for nothing. Not a terrible battle and an interesting concept, but the ability balance does mark this fight a little bit. Lastly, we have our fight with Thanatos, which we take on with the help of Deimos. This fight is really enjoyable and honestly a lot of fun. Thanatos has quite the arsenal of attacks at his disposal, a lot of health, and throughout the fight you'll need the help of Deimos or vice versa. His larger form isn't as much of a threat but he does fire a projectile at lightning speed that is a tricky attack to parry. This is a great final fight though, as you have a lot to worry about, the Scourge of Erinus isn't as useful as in other battles as Thanatos can escape its stun lock, his attacks are various and hard to nail down by wind ups and having to take into account Deimos' well being and location in the fight makes for a great engaging battle. On the whole, the bosses are a good bit of fun. They aren't all winners but they are all enjoyable despite the lack in challenges for most. Highlights again go to Thanatos and Erinus personally, as they are more challenging battles of the game which personally I enjoy more. But the set piece and spectacle of Scylla is also worth remembering and these bosses feel like they are worth remembering amongst the series, which for a portable entry is a hell of an accomplishment. Much like Chains of Olympus, the other components that make up the God of War formula aren't as present here in Ghost of Sparta as that of the console games. But this time around they definitely tried to include more platforming than before. Unfortunately they added the wrong sort of platforming with planks making a return despite no challenge or distraction, wall fights and chain combat. This feels like the wrong answer to Chains of Olympus heavy combat focus and I understand they wanted Ghost of Sparta to play more like God of War 2. 
taking moments straight from it, even the coolest platforming moment in the game. But they brought back mechanics that hadn't aged well and didn't improve them. The platforming overall isn't bad, but the decision to bring back these mechanics did leave me scratching my head. The puzzles are also seemingly non-existent. I mean, I really can't think of any. Overall, I know I've been a little more negative than usual in regards to Ghost of Sparta's gameplay, but honestly, that's only because a lot of the positives I would have said, well, I've already gone over them in previous videos. The combat is still a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed messing around with the new abilities and trying out the iconic arms of Sparta. The bosses, whilst not overly challenging, are still great to experience and deliver that power fantasy. But the platforming inclusions are odd and the lack of puzzles is strange, and I'd just have liked to have had more options and variety inserted into the combat here with balancing in regards to the weapons and abilities. On the whole though, I did have a great time playing Ghost of Sparta, and whilst it may have backstepped in some aspects from Chains of Olympus, as a whole, it was a great improvement. So, was God of War, Ghost of Sparta worth remembering? Overall, I'd say yes, but it's by no means perfect. The story is a great insight into Kratos' backstory, further fleshing out the Ghost of Sparta, but some areas in the story needed more time or explanation to feel more satisfying. The gameplay feels more like God of War 2 this time around, which is a net positive, and it's still a blast to play with some great boss fights and set pieces along the way. It just isn't as balanced as I would have liked, and the lack of variety can lead to a feeling of repetition, which shouldn't be happening in a less than 5 hour game. Along with odd re-inclusions in the platforming and the exclusion of puzzles that does hurt the flow of the game a tad. But as a whole, it does learn a lot from Chains of Olympus and enhances the God of War portable experience. Again, these portable entries may not be the best games in the series, but they are great portable games that Ready at Dawn pulled off incredibly well. And I don't see why any God of War fan wouldn't enjoy either game because I had a great time with Ghost of Sparta, even after all these years. Where do you go from God of War 3? Many fans of the series, myself included, wondered that same question after completing God of War 3 back in 2010. And whilst we got Ghost of Sparta that same year, it wasn't until March 2013 when we finally got our answer from Santa Monica. You don't. Instead of moving on from the Greek myths, God of War Ascension gave us yet another prequel this time set before the entire series. Not the game many fans had hoped for, in fact Ascension was the first game in the series where upon seeing its announcement back in April 2012, I was... Well, I wouldn't say I wasn't hyped, because as I've made perfectly clear up to this point, I love the series, but I wasn't as excited as I had been before. Was I still going to pick Ascension up day one? Of course, but I think myself, like many others at that point, were ready for a change in scenery. Nevertheless, in March 2013, I went to my local EB Games, picked the game up and smashed it out over the course of a weekend and enjoyed it. I wasn't blown away by the game, but as has been the case with each entry in the series, I had a good time playing through both the single player and newly added multiplayer offerings. But the game didn't leave a lasting impression, which is why today I can't remember really bugger all about it. I remember the opening boss battle and the infamous elevator encounter, but other than that, before revisiting the game today, I'd have said Ascension is alright, but nothing special. Personally, I do think franchise fatigue had set in by this point, which wasn't exclusive to God of War at this time, but that will be the real test today, as I've covered the series so far back to back. Enough stalling though. Now that I've finished revisiting God of War Ascension, the question is, how well does the game hold up today and is it worth your time revisiting or playing for the first time? Let's find out. Oh, and I don't have an online pass for the game and I'm definitely not paying for one, so we'll just be covering the single player experience.
Ascension opens with a depiction of the war between the Primordials and the origins of the three Guardians of Honor, the Furies. The Furies were tasked with exacting punishment on betrayers or oathbreakers, the first of which was the Hecatonchires Aesian, who broke his blood oath with Zeus. The Furies believe death is too kind a fate for one who breaks an oath to a god and transforming the enormous Hecatonchires into a prison to house all those who dare follow in his footsteps. The Furies would later encounter the god of war Ares, under whose ruthless guidance they would begin to form a plan to overtake Olympus. The only problem with this plan is they don't have the necessary forces, needing the perfect warrior to aid in their attack against the gods. The Queen of the Furies, Alecto, mates with Ares in the hopes of creating just that, but their son Orcos was not up to Ares' standards and subsequently disowns him. The Furies see worth in Orcos though, making him the keeper of oaths. We know who Ares ultimately chooses to be said warrior though, moulding Kratos into a heartless killing machine, but oversteps when he forces Kratos to kill his family, resulting in Kratos breaking his oath to the god of war. Now, the plot itself goes back and forth between present day and the journey before Kratos was finally captured by the Furies, so to make this synopsis flow nice and smoothly, let's just go over the story in its correct order. Ares, furious over Kratos' betrayal, orders the Furies to capture him for breaking his oath, which sees the three sisters attempting to weaken the ghost of Sparta's mind by casting illusions in order to mentally weaken and torture him. Electo's son Orcos believes Kratos' punishment isn't justified and betrays the Furies, allying himself with Kratos and informing him that the key to his freedom from Ares can be found in Delphi with the oracle Aletheia. Kratos kills Pollux and Castor, the prophets who imprisoned the oracle, but she ends up being mortally wounded and with her last breath reveals that Kratos needs to travel to Delos and retrieve the Eyes of Truth, as they are the key to killing the Furies and ultimately severing his bond to the God of War. Skipping ahead a little bit, well, a lot. Kratos reaches the Eyes of Truth after a lengthy journey, but finds Orcos and himself ambushed by the three Fury Sisters, and ultimately ends in his imprisonment within the Hecatonchires, leading us all the way back to the beginning of the game and present day. Kratos suffers from torture at the hands of the Furies, refusing their offers to return to Ares. One of the Furies, Majira, who had her arm cut off in a previous capture attempt from Kratos, becomes overzealous in her torturing of Kratos and accidentally breaks the chains that bind him. This accident allows Kratos to free himself as he attacks Majira, who becomes enraged and uses her parasites to return Aegean back to life, causing this massive prison to attack. Kratos manages to evade the behemoth's attacks and after some chase slay Majira in the process. Kratos encounters the remaining Furies who through illusions try to lure him back to Ares by seducing him in the form of his wife and child. Kratos comes to, realizing this to be an illusion and not reality, and after an intense battle manages to kill both remaining Furies, breaking Tisephone's neck and stabbing Alecto to death. Kratos returns to his home in Sparta where Orcos meets him and reveals that before the Furies' deaths, they once again made him Kratos' Oathkeeper, and the only way to remove both Kratos and Orcos' bonds to Ares is for Kratos to kill Orcos. Kratos begrudgingly agrees and drives a blade through Orcos, finally severing his bond to Ares, but taking on those nightmarish visions that would haunt him for the rest of the series, which were previously masked through this bond. Ascension ends with Kratos burning down his home in Sparta along with Orcos' body, and that is the story of God of War Ascension. I think an element I've neglected to touch on in regards to the other prequel tales is, well, is this a story that needed to be told? Personally, more information is always appreciated, but I bring this point up because Ascension isn't what I'd describe as need-to-know story inclusions. I mean, we know you can't just break an oath to a god and suffer no repercussions, but what else does this story add? 
Whilst I do have my problems with the story, I still really enjoyed experiencing what was on offer here. Probably my favourite element about Ascension's story is those illusions. Don't get me wrong, they are incredibly obvious that that's what they are, and whilst I was never like, what? That wasn't real? They do provide further insight into Kratos' character. What he cares about, how he interacts with those he cares for, and how annoyed and angry he becomes at the constant realisation that it's the Furies playing tricks on his mind is a great insight into a character many boil down to just angry man angry. The final illusion is probably my favourite as it shows Kratos would rather choose his reality than be in debt or imprisoned by Ares any longer as he was the reason he can't hold his wife or daughter anymore. It's these illusions as well that make the Furies feel like a true villain. They don't just appear at the end, we get further backstory about them revealing who they were before Ares, and the way they are constantly involved in the story through the hunt and eventual capture and torturing of Kratos makes them a villainous trio we want to defeat. As always, seeing what myths Santa Monica would include in their Greek universe this time is always exciting and there are some badass renditions of these myths here in Ascension. The Hecatonkeries is far and away my favourite new myth and I'll dive into this a little more in the gameplay but just the enormous scale and design makes you want to go out and find out more behind this rendition. The Furies are also filled with potential as each sister has a specific trait or meaning such as unceasing anger, jealousy and avenger of murder. And again they do create a great villain here in Ascension. The uncomfortable to look at Pollux and Castor reminded me a lot of Quado from Total Recall. It's all these little inclusions that I look forward to seeing in the series. As I said though, the story does have its share of problems, and possibly the biggest one is how the story is told. If you're going to have this back and forth storytelling, usually you want to build up to some sort of twist, but instead what Ascension does with this method is remove the feeling of tension or surprise. You know you don't kill any of the Furies in the past because we've seen them in the present. We know we don't accomplish our goal because we're stuck in prison in the present. When your story revolves around the Furies hunting you, I don't want to know I fail at some point because then all I'm waiting for is how did it happen, which is relatively anticlimactic. I would have preferred they either begin the story as they do with Kratos in chains and then breaking free and go on a journey to pursue a way to kill the Furies or begin the story whilst the Furies are pursuing Kratos but as it is, it just feels like they want to begin the game with a massive set piece and then begin telling the story because you don't have any of your elemental powers in the beginning and yet when you go back to the present you magically do. It just feels poorly thought out. Also, as much as I enjoy the story moments in the illusions as well, I would have liked to have seen these moments be more unclear as to whether they are illusions or not, because it's obvious to the player that this is all a trick. Overall though, I did enjoy experiencing the story, but as has been the case with the portable and prequel entries, it's best not to look at it all too closely. I think if nothing else, Ascension is a simple, fun journey revealing some nice details behind Kratos' quest, ultimately to destroy Olympus, and once again, shows an important softer side to the Ghost of Sparta that too many simply brush aside. The Furies make for a great villain despite the lack of surprise about the various encounters and the story sets up these incredible set pieces. I just wish the way the story had been told was better and left more things up in the air or if they wanted to keep this method of storytelling then develop the twists and turns properly instead of letting the player know so much in the opening moments. On the whole, I did enjoy the story for Ascension in the moment though, and whilst I don't think it competes all that well with the best stories of the series, it is still a fun ride. The gameplay for God of War Ascension is an interesting one because it feels like Santa Monica knew by this point fatigue with the gameplay formula would be setting in, and whilst they wanted to mix it up, they also didn't, or at least that's how it feels playing the game. 
It feels like they wanted to keep the core of God of War's gameplay intact, but try adding or changing some things around to make it feel fresh, and at least personally, Ascension's gameplay mechanics took me a little bit to get used to after my brain had become so hardwired with the tried and true formula. So somehow, Ascension does feel like a fresh experience whilst not changing all that much, which is impressive. But does that mean it's good? As always, let's talk combat first. On the surface, the combat looks to be fairly similar to that of God of War 3, but it plays much differently. In terms of Kratos' arsenal this time around in Ascension, we just have our Blades of Chaos, but this time swap between four elements in the Fire of Ares, Ice of Poseidon, Lightning of Zeus, and Souls of Hades each with their own special light and heavy attack along with a magic ability, but those options aren't included with the base element, so you'll need to upgrade each element to reach their full potential. Whilst we just have the one constant weapon this time around, Kratos is able to pick up enemy swords, clubs, slingshots, shields, and spears. The rage meter doesn't stick around after combat encounters, so don't bother saving it up anymore, but it can also be depleted quickly if you take some hits, and this time around, parrying is tied to an L1 and X combination, and you can grapple onto enemies as well as disarm them. It doesn't sound like too much of a difference, but these additions and changes do impact the general flow of the combat, and I'll be honest, I don't think in a good way. I've gone over this before, but the fluidity and general flow of God of War's combat was what made it so much fun to play, and here in Ascension, that flow just doesn't exist a lot of the time. Far too many enemies can sit back and block, enemy encounters with juggernauts and shielded enemies leave you waiting around for too long trying to find an opening to either attack or disarm them, the environmental weapons feel all but useless, just having the blades of chaos leaves me wanting more variety that whilst is somewhat there with the different elements, isn't enough. Even small things like changing up the parry to a two combo setup means even even just to have a damaging block isn't this quick or effective tool in Kratos' arsenal. I think they tampered with the combat formula in the wrong sort of way, trying to create more strategic encounters and combat moments. But without the variety in weapons and the fluidity in motion, due to how the enemies behave, I just never felt like I could get into any sort of rhythm here. That's not to say I didn't enjoy the combat at all this time around, because as always, when it does all come together, it still feels great. Not to mention, most of these criticisms I've just listed were from looking back on my playtime rather than what I felt in the moment. I enjoyed using the different elements and unlocking more magic and stronger combinations. The souls of Hades in particular feel incredibly powerful, along with Lightning of Zeus feeling like a great stunning ability ability that allows Kratos more time to flow between attacks. I also enjoyed the change to the quick time events as they have a more up close and gritty look whilst dodging returning attacks only to finish enemies off with a good old brain transplant or simply splitting them in two. You can also now see when enemies can be grabbed and when they'll be executed allowing the player to know when they can utilize the enemy as a weapon or when they're out for the count. Leveling up your arsenal is a little more complicated a question this time around in a good way given the elements need to reach max rank to unlock their magic attack, but you get a damage increase per level with the blades. The change to the rage meter whilst at times frustrating as one hit will knock the meter down is still a welcome addition forcing me to use the ability far more in combat and depending on the element you get different rage powers. There is still enjoyment to be had here with Ascension's combat, but this is nowhere near the series best, especially considering it's clear Santa Monica were attempting to halt that feeling of franchise fatigue. And yet the blades are the only viable weapon on offer, you won't unlock each element's full potential until closer to the end of the game, which is this game's only source of variety, and most importantly, Certain enemy encounters simply remove any semblance of flow or rhythm about the combat. 
On the nitpickier side as well, the camera can be far too zoomed out in a few instances, making combat even harder to pull off because, well, I can't really see what I'm doing, or even where I am. The default brightness is well and truly too dark, which again, let me see what's going on. And the frame rate, whilst this is mainly applicable to the cutscenes, can dip in combat as well, which is a series first, at least from what I've experienced, while revisiting the series today. So the combat is a mixed bag to say the least, but how do the boss fights stack up this time around? On the whole, they're pretty good, but they do repeat a few fights which I'm personally not a fan of. As always, Ascension begins with a boss battle coming up against the behemoth, Hecatonchires Asian. The first phase consists of Kratos battling one of the infected Hecatonchires arms, which reminds me a lot of the fight in God of War 3 against the Hippocampi. As has been the case with each first boss, this is more so a battle to flush out the cobwebs or teach players what to expect, so don't expect the most challenging fight, but there's a lot to like here. What I especially enjoyed about this first phase was that it revolves around the environment. Since the Hecatonchires is a living prison, he moves around quite a lot, again, much like Gaia did in 3. So you'll be constantly moving, even have an arena that involves Kratos hiding from the monster's swipes, which although out of character, mixes this boss up from the rest. Sometime later, we re-encounter the monster, this time feeling like the Colossus of Rhodes, as you have a wider arena, enemies to look out for, and dodging this massive creature's attacks. After this encounter, we finally slay this hideous creature, Majira attacks and then swiftly retreats and then infects Asian's head, which begins the final phase. This part of the phase has so much potential, but unfortunately the camera is too far off, you're on a time limit, and the enemies do not give you a second to breathe, followed by a back and forth battle with Kratos, the head, and another hand monster, which then leads to a badass hijacking on the hand to ultimately slay the Hecatonchires. Overall, the Hecatonchires is a good tutorial fight that at times favours spectacle over gameplay. Yes, it reminds me of other battles in the past, but it still feels great to slay such massive beasts, teaches the player many mechanics will need for later, the Hecatonchires always feels like a present threat throughout the opening, and if they just improved some aspects of the initial head battle, I'd have a hard time faulting this fight. Next is the battle against the Manticore, which does feel a bit like a standard enemy, like a battle against a Cerberus. It can be quite tricky, don't get me wrong, as his ground attacks are quick and the Manticore mixes up its attacks really well. It's a solid fight, but doesn't warrant a second encounter. And yet it does later in the game, just without the ability to fly from the get-go. Not bad, but I don't get that feeling of slaying a boss like the rest of the, well, bosses. After this though, we come up against Pollux and Castor, and this is one of the series' best battles. The battle begins with a platforming challenge, which whilst not too difficult, is a good mix-up from the rest, which I appreciate, but once we tackle the twins one-on-one, -on -one, the fight truly begins. The twins have a wealth of attacks both up close and range-based that are well telegraphed to boot, which makes for a great chess match of dodging, parrying, and finding openings to attack. As the fight progresses, they'll begin destroying the arena, leading to the player needing to make quick decisions, which is easier said than done, as you can also be caught in a time warp that slows Kratos down. The twins will then retreat to the top of the pillars, which is simple enough to get them down, but once they return, they'll now begin to teleport, making the fight even more so engaging, and giving us more to think about. This all leads to a strange first-person view, where we end up knocking out Castor, and go head Head to head with Pollux, who is the one with the telekinetic powers, and this phase is tough, as Pollux will send out projectiles, hits the ground with so much more force, uses more time slowing AoEs, and removes chunks of the arena. The fight ends with Kratos separating the twins and stomping on Pollux's head. Again, this is one of the series' best boss battles, and it's truly a lot of fun to participate in. The twins have numerous attacks, as the player you have a lot to worry about other than just the boss, and it's once it's just Pollux, the true challenge of this fight is present. Best boss in the game by far, and up there with the likes of Zeus as one of my favourites. Lastly, we have the Fury fights, which whilst 
I don't think they are bad by any means. Some are even really great, but more often than not, I wasn't excited to see them as Majira and Tosiphone appear too often. Now rather than go over each encounter, I'm just going to assess each Fury's overall boss credentials. Majira is the simplest of the sisters as she primarily uses those spider legs with some range and AoE attacks. I liken her to more of a tutorial fight though as she is pretty easy to battle on her own but helps prepare you for the more complex attacks from Tosephone. Tosephone is a much quicker opponent. She covers ground quickly, has numerous attacks mainly of the sorcery variety, and she can take away that health bar quite quickly as well. You rarely get a battle with just Tosephone though, and she acts more often than not like a supporting boss, making Majira invincible for example, but when the sisters team up does make for a more engaging battle, as there is a lot going on all at once. Lastly is the Fury Queen Electo, which if nothing else is an incredible, and I mean incredible, set piece as she transforms into this intimidating giant sea monster. This battle isn't the most challenging once again and involves many aspects we've seen before like destroying some tentacles attacking the ship or Electo's full form feeling like the Hydra from God of War 2, just without the puzzle aspect. Her attacks are simple enough to dodge. Tosiphone tries to help by using the attacks we've grown accustomed to by this point, and ultimately, we slay both sisters. Now overall, the Furies do have enjoyable battles, with the battle against Majira and Tosiphone probably being my favourite in regards to the boss fight, but the battle against Electo being just a great set piece to end the game on. But they appear too often to a point where if they aren't changing up their attacks, well it just feels repetitive as well as offering no real surprise. On the whole though, the bosses in Ascension are all enjoyable. The battle against the Hecatonkeries and Electo are incredible spectacles. The fight against Pollux and Castor and Majira and Tosephone are the best feeling fights with the twins in the conversation for one of the best in the series. But some bosses do feel like others a bit too much and repeating bosses more often than not feels a bit too lazy and except for the Gemini twins, I don't know how memorable I'll find the rest of these fights in the future. Outside of all the combat though, how does the platforming and the puzzles stack up this time around? First of all, the platforming in a weird way feels a bit more like Uncharted this time around, at least in regards to the climbing. There are more climbing segments with a feeling of more freedom and three dimensions about it, although they can drag on for a little too long. The new addition to the platforming in Ascension is the abundance of sliding. Kratos slips and slides all over this game, and whilst personally I didn't mind these moments, they do repeat a little too often. The highlights again go to the initial platforming from the twins battle, as well as traversing the broken statue of Apollo, which feels really well paced out between combat, platforming, and puzzles, which is great to see. The puzzles in Ascension clearly got a bit more love and attention this time around though, and it shows because I had a great time with a lot of the puzzles here. I'm not going to touch on the complexity of the puzzles as, well, I'm rather simple and even the most obvious solutions seem to take me a minute to figure out. But with the healing and decaying mechanic, or cloning yourself temporarily, there are some great moments to be had. The first big puzzle is actually a whole area in the Temple of the Oracle. You have a lot of time-based mechanics with the decaying mist, progressing further and further to access more pieces to the puzzle, and whilst initially it can be daunting, by the end it does feel satisfying to solve as well as feeling straightforward once you have all the facts. Another highlight goes to the one with the conveyor belt and the giant crystal, as usually the cloning puzzles are rather straightforward, but this one, because it isn't straightforward, had me wondering if it was a cloning puzzle at all. I really enjoyed this puzzle's design, and it was a good time completing despite the combat encounter beforehand, making me, let's say, not so stoked. Outside of these examples, there is a lot of time decaying environment pieces or sending your clone to keep a lever in place, but on the whole, I'd say the puzzles here are a real highlight for Ascension. 
overall, God of War Ascension's gameplay is a bit of a mixed bag. There are some great boss encounters to be had, the puzzles are really enjoyable, the platforming whilst a little simpler than usual breaks up the combat well, but the combat is the game's biggest flaw for me. I understand what Santa Monica was trying to accomplish, franchise fatigue is a tricky issue especially with a long running series, but the additions and changes disrupt the flow too much. The new enemies and their weapons along with the lack of variety in Kratos' arsenal just make this combat system feel lesser to that of the rest of the series. And as someone who loves God of War's combat, that's a big issue. Not always unenjoyable, but I never questioned enjoying the combat in any of the games until now. And I think that says a lot. So, was God of War Ascension worth remembering? On the whole, I'd have to say no. Which does suck because my mindset going into the game was that Ascension was possibly an underrated experience in this series. But that just wasn't the case and probably why I may have sounded a bit negative over the course of this video. That's not to say I didn't enjoy revisiting Ascension because there are definitely some aspects I did enjoy. I always enjoy seeing a softer side to Kratos, which the story provided. Boss fights like Pollux and Castor or the Hecatonkeries and Electo are a lot of fun to participate in. The puzzles were great fun and the platforming, whilst dumbed down in certain aspects, broke up the combat well. My biggest issue with Ascension is the combat though, as it just lacks two very important pillars in flow and variety. I still enjoyed myself, but the more I reflect, the more I question, well, how? Ascension is far from a bad game, but in the battle to combat franchise fatigue, they simply just didn't succeed, at least in the single player portion. As disappointing as I was with Ascension though, if nothing else, I believe I am finally in the right mindset to re-tackle God of War 2018, because I am in need of a reboot now myself. Well, here we are, the final entry in this series of retrospectives on the God of War series so far. We've covered it all from the series best to the worst, but now we're finally here. God of War 2018, a game that has been continuously praised as not only the best God of War game, but recently was dubbed the greatest game of all time. Let's just get this over with. When I initially played God of War 4 or 2018, I thought the game was alright. I didn't love the game like many others, but I didn't hate it either. I was just left feeling pretty meh about it all. I'm not sure if this was due to hype or too lofty expectations, but I just wasn't thrilled with what I experienced back in 2018. However, as time went on, my opinions toward the game shifted more and more towards despising this game. And it wasn't really due to anything the game did, but more so others' comments about the game. I think I've made this perfectly evident in this series of retrospectives, but just in case you knew, I love the God of War series, and what I noticed was happening in this game's reception was to build up how great God of War 2018 is, many felt the need to disrespect the rest of the series. I hate to do it, but I've got to call out a fellow Aussie here to show as an example of what I mean. We've seen games where they try to tell an interesting story and be weighty and meaningful, and we're going to try and do it too, with the character who cannot possibly do this. This is far di but they've done something here with a character that they've turned, they've turned water into wine. You didn't play the other God of War. Very limited you? experience, yeah, a bit very, very limited. Or something? I played yeah. the demo of three. Now, Endless Jess has done an in-depth video about what I'm trying to get across here, but these were the sort of comments made about God of War 2018 downplaying the rest of the series, even though apparently they don't know much about the series to begin with. As a fan of the series, this is what made me dislike God of War 2018 so much. I knew I was in the minority with my opinions, and to be honest, I was just happy God of War was getting so much love, even though I didn't personally see the hype. 
but seeing so many comments like the one I just showed to you just made me hate the game over time. With that little rant out of the way though, I was actually very excited to revisit God of War 2018 today. You never know if you just weren't in the right mood at the time, went into the game with too much hype, etc. And I wanted to see if playing the game today, I could finally join the majority and praise God of War 2018. I finished replaying the series so far back to back and now I'm ready for a change in pace. So now that I've finished revisiting God of War, the question is simply, is God of War better than I remembered? Let's find out. The story for God of War is set decades after the fall of Olympus, as Kratos has travelled to a new land of Midgard in ancient Norway, now living with his son Atreus. Kratos' second wife and Atreus' mother, Faye, has recently passed, leaving them with one final request. Spread her ashes atop the highest peak in all of the Nine Realms. Kratos and Atreus mourned their loved one's loss before going on a hunt as Kratos' test to see if Atreus is ready to fare the perils of the outside world. Atreus' performance leaves Kratos disappointed and reconsidering taking him on this journey. After returning home though, Kratos is attacked by a mysterious stranger who we quickly realise has godlike powers and cannot feel anything physical. Ultimately, Kratos defeats the stranger, seemingly killing him, but with a new threat of danger, Kratos now must take Atreus on this journey. Quickly after setting off on our quest through shooting a magical boar, we encounter a mysterious but seemingly friendly Witch of the Woods, who, after we help save said boar, helps us in return by unlocking a passage to the Lake of Nine. On the lake, we find the last remaining giant in the World Serpent, Jormungandr. Kratos and Atreus begin to make their way up the mountain in Midgard before running into an impenetrable black mist, which can only be passed through with the light of Alfheim. The Witch of the Woods gifts Kratos the Bifrost in order to travel to Alfheim and secure the light. Now with the light, Kratos and Atreus make their way to the peak of the mountain where they find the stranger who attacked them very much alive and accompanied by two henchmen, the sons of Thor, Magni and Modi, interrogating a man imprisoned within a tree who we learn is Mimir. Once the three leave, Kratos and Atreus confront Mimir, who reveals that stranger is Baldur, one of the Norse gods and son of Odin. Mimir also informs Kratos and Atreus that the highest peak in all the realms isn't in Midgard, but Jotunheim instead. However, access to said realm has long been blocked off by Odin and Thor. Mimir knows of another entry into the land of the giants though and instructs Kratos to cut off his head in the hopes of either being revived or ending his eternal suffering. When Mimir's head is revived by the witch, Mimir realises she is the goddess Freya and now revealed to be a god, Kratos immediately distrusts her. Knowing Kratos' own secret, Mimir and Freya warn him to tell Atreus about his true nature as a god, which Kratos has kept secret up to this point. Whilst out searching for the various components to open the gate to Jotunheim, Kratos, Atreus and Mimir are attacked by Modi and Magni. Kratos ends up slaying Magni, which Modi witnesses and in shock flees, but later returns as Kratos fends him off and leaves Atreus to suddenly collapse ill after the mental contradiction of a god believing they are mortal. Returning to Freya, we are instructed to head to Helheim to find a heart of a certain troll, but our trusty Leviathan axe is useless in this realm, forcing Kratos to retrieve his iconic Blades of Chaos. Once we retrieve the heart in Hell, we return back to Freya and cure Atreus, and now Kratos comes clean, telling Atreus that they are both gods. With this new knowledge, Atreus becomes honestly insufferable for a while, slaying the weakened Modi despite Kratos' request, and we reach the peak of Midgard and the gate of Jotunheim. This goes pear-shaped 
quickly as Baldur appears and in the ensuing battle, the portal is destroyed and Kratos, Atreus, Mimir and Baldur are hurled into Helheim. Now learning his lesson that he isn't all powerful, Atreus apologizes to Kratos and while escaping hell, through Baldur's visions we learn that Freya is his mother and his invulnerability is due to her overwhelming need to protect him casting a spell to protect him from all physical and magical threats, but also making him unable to feel anything, not even the simple joys in life, which has caused Boulder to resent his mother. We manage to escape hell and make our way back to Midgard when Mimir realizes there is yet another way into Jotunheim, but he needs his other eye, which is inside the world serpent due to eating Thor's statue. Once we go inside the belly of the friendly beast and retrieve Mimir's eye, the world serpent is attacked by Boulder, and now comes the final showdown. Freya attempts to stop the fighting at all costs, but with a punch to Atreus, a stray mistletoe arrow pierces Boulder's skin and breaks Freya's spell. Kratos and Atreus go head to head with Boulder in an epic battle and finally defeat him. Kratos gives Boulder the opportunity to retreat, trying to connect and warn him of the price of revenge. But Boulder doesn't listen and begins to strangle Freya, forcing Kratos to finally kill him. Freya is distraught, promising her revenge and taunts Kratos for hiding his true nature. Kratos reveals to Atreus that he killed his father and fellow Greek gods, but continues on to say they should learn from their experiences and not repeat prior generation's mistakes, aka don't kill me son. Freya leaves with Baldur's corpse and Mimir hopes she will eventually see that Kratos had done the right thing. Finally, Kratos and Atreus reach Jotunheim finding a temple depicting their adventure so far as the giants had foreseen everything that would happen with some hints of what's to come. It's also here they learned that Faye was a giant who decided to stay in Midgard after the others left, making Atreus part god, part giant, and part mortal. It's here we also find out that Boulder was after Faye the whole time, unaware of her passing. We learn that Faye wanted to name Atreus Loki instead, which is why that's what he is referred to in the temple. We reach the top of the highest peak in all the realms, fulfilling their promise as they spread the ashes overlooking a valley of giant's corpses. Kratos and Atreus return to Midgard, where Mimir warns them that the three year long Fimble Winter has begun, meaning Ragnarok is not far behind though this was not supposed to occur for another hundred years. After a long journey, Atreus and Kratos return home and get a well-earned rest, where Atreus has a vision that Thor will arrive at the end of Fimblewinter and confront them. And that is the story for God of War. All right, there's a lot to go over here, but let's get this out of the way in the beginning. Not only is the story much better than I remember, but it is the best story in the series. The reason as to why this is the best story in the series though is because of what has been built and established through the prior six games. Seven if you include Betrayal, but I mean, why would you? As someone who has played through this series back to back and seen the character arc and development of our beloved Kratos, the change or growth here in God of War 4 makes a lot of sense. No, this isn't the first time we've seen a softer side to the ghost of Sparta. We've seen him show compassion, empathy, regret, and how he is as a father and husband. The difference here in God of War 4 is he doesn't have the overwhelming desire for vengeance, and now that he has accomplished that quest and desire, well, his character arc can become more focused on the other aspects we've seen him show throughout the series. It's not as if Santa Monica has completely shifted his character to something that is so foreign to what we know he can be. And not only that, but they use his past here in God of War 4 to great effect to show how far he has come without his tunnel vision of revenge. And now seeing with much more clarity 
and with the luxury of hindsight. I wanted to say all of this in the beginning of my thoughts because as I said, Kratos' past and his character development through the prior games is too often ignored. Not by Santa Monica, but by journalists, outlets, and even some of my favorite content creators. The story is so great because it's a direction that makes sense for Kratos, and Santa Monica does a great job at highlighting that here in God of War 4. Kratos hiding his past from his son Atreus is a big aspect of this story. Obviously, the first half of the game and this story is more so about building this new world and expanding upon how Kratos and Atreus can make it to the highest peak in all the realms. But as the story goes on, Kratos is continuously hiding not only Atreus' true nature, but his past actions as well. The reason why Kratos is withholding this information makes sense as he believes being a god to be a curse. Seeing what the gods of Olympus had become, as well as himself, but Kratos isn't just hiding his past from his son, he's also suppressing it from himself, which is why moments like the first encounter with Boulder have the impact they do. He only activates the rage of Sparta within him when absolutely necessary, because he cannot control himself. The rage of his old self does evidently worry Kratos, afraid he may return to his old ways, and this fear is further shown once Atreus falls ill. Kratos not telling Atreus of his godlike nature has now put Atreus in a life-threatening situation, and his somber journey home only highlights how much he wants to move forward in his life. How he did not want his son to be affected by this curse, but he cannot outrun his past, and now he must, at least personally, face some of his demons. You truly do feel like you're traveling to Kratos' personal hell on this trip home as you encounter the ghost or spirit of Athena before ultimately uncovering the iconic blades of chaos hidden away hoping to never see the light of day. Santa Monica really makes the blades reveal both incredibly awesome for fans of the series but also shows perfectly that Kratos doesn't want to ever use these weapons. He has to and using his blades again in hell only seems to further bring back his past through the visions of Zeus. It's these moments related to Kratos' past that brings fans of the series into this story a lot more. And I'm glad Santa Monica didn't just ignore all of this and move on to a new realm and mythology and had the big story moments center around Kratos' life before Midgard. Once Kratos finally tells Atreus of his god status, predictably, the power goes to his head. And yes, for a moment, the boy becomes insufferable. Ignoring Kratos, doing his own thing, it all is very hard to watch stuff, but again, in a way that makes sense. Telling a kid he's a god, how else was this going to go? But thankfully, he learns his lesson from Boulder real quick. Now, I'll return to Kratos soon, but whilst we're on Atreus, I love his arc here as well. Look, if your dad's Kratos, you're gonna want that man's approval, which is what Atreus wants. But Kratos is frequently doubting Atreus, questioning if he's ready to venture outside. Are his skills up to scratch? Can he handle his emotions? It's clear Kratos wants to teach Atreus how to become an effective warrior the Spartan way, which, well, doesn't involve a lot of love or gratification. And whilst this is making Atreus a great warrior and gradually garnering Kratos' approval, naturally you still just want your dad to love you and show that affection. That's not to say it isn't obvious Kratos loves and cares for his son. In fact, a lot of his reactions and teachings are due to a feeling of worry, but he's not the best at showing Atreus openly how he feels. It's because of all of this though that Atreus does begin to grow right before us, beginning as well a beginner and gradually feeling more comfortable not only in combat but in himself as well, to a point where he needs to be knocked down a few pegs and then knowing his limits and what he can and can't do just yet. Atreus is a great character and seeing his connection with Kratos blossom over the course of the game was another true highlight, especially when both begin to open up more about the passing of Faye, who is shrouded in mystery for us the player, so it's great to, at least here, know how their dynamics worked. Whilst we're talking other characters though, the whole cast here is 
incredible. Mamir is another character we get to know quite a lot about as he is literally connected at the hip to Kratos and he and Atreus help build up this world really beautifully. Learning about the giants, the world serpent, the gods like Odin and Thor, the different realms, it's through Mimir and Atreus that makes the player want to stay around a little longer on the boat journeys just to let them finish which is pretty incredible in its own right. Sindri and Brock are definitely this game's comic relief characters as they jive and hurl insults at one another but it was always great to stumble across these guys throughout the world and they do have some serious moments too and points of reflection like when a cocky Atreus berates Sindri for going over the same story all the time which in the moment feels horrible and just further shows Atreus needs to come back to reality but it ends up working out for the best as Sindri and Brock reunite. But this all leads me to Freya and Boulder. First of all, Boulder is a great antagonist for this game. In the beginning, you're just thinking, what the hell is this guy thinking coming at Kratos like this? But I'm glad he was such a presence in the game because Santa Monica fleshes his story out really well. Learning he can't be killed, he will not stop hunting Kratos and Atreus only to learn that he is the son of Freya who has been helping you this whole time making you question what her true intentions are. It's in the final battle with Boulder though where I think his character truly peaks which is sort of a shame that he dies so soon after but obviously it makes sense. Seeing such a pure lust for vengeance like that of the old Kratos is great to see and having Kratos try and console him, warning him that the aftermath and feeling after conquering that quest for revenge isn't worth it, which isn't just something we hear Kratos say, but has been shown through his actions throughout the story, showing mercy far more. Also, when Boulder is finally free of his curse, the dread from Freya, yet the pure joy in his face from Boulder was a great touch, seeing just how miserable missing the finer details in life was for Boulder and why he would seek revenge against Freya. Then we have the emotions and pure, almost satanic and psychotic way Freya threatens revenge against Kratos for killing Boulder is a quality scene and whilst I agree with Kratos that it needed to be done, I'm not going to pretend like Freya's reaction isn't justified as well. Then capping all of this off with Kratos finally admitting to Atreus why he left Greece and what he has done was just the cherry on top and then you realise this isn't even the ending. Finally reaching Jotunheim after this epic adventure is so sweet. Learning about Faye's past finally and who she is. Seeing the sad vision of the deceased giants. Learning about Faye wanting to call Atreus Loki instead and why Kratos chose to name him Atreus due to a Spartan comrade, it all wraps up so damn well. And all of this just made for a story that when it was all said and done, it almost got me. Just one of those emotions where you're sad to see it end, but acknowledge how great of a journey it was to experience. This is all without talking about the mythology, which is once again loosely based off Norse myths. But as always, what having these myths involved in a story like this does, if nothing else, is make me curious as to where they pulled these ideas from. Seeing this rendition of the World Serpent, a unique spin on Boulder, Freya, Magni and Modi, the sons of Thor, and even just hearing about gods like Tyr, Odin, and getting a brief glimpse of Thor, and setting up Atreus as Loki, and all the renditions of the Nine Realms, Santa Monica truly did a fantastic job at gathering so many great myths from such a rich, subject matter and making it their own thing that makes it not only amazing to see in game but makes you want to see how they potentially got here. Look, as I said in the beginning and I'm sure I'll say it again, this is a whole lot better than I remember to a point where, well, I don't even know what I was thinking. Maybe my nostalgia for the series was so high, or my hype and anticipation got to me, I'm not too sure, but it truly is the best story in the series. I cannot stress this enough though, the reason why I think the story succeeds so well is because of the foundation built throughout the rest of the series. 
Santa Monica does a great job at building up this new world, its characters and its conflicts, but the carrying over factor that being Kratos, is why it works so well. Everything comes back to Kratos' past. This may be a Kratos not fueled by vengeance, and whilst he has matured, he has just grown into a version of himself we already knew he could be. I can't think of many aspects of this story I didn't enjoy outside of the fact that maybe at times it can feel like they added an extra hurdle onto the main quest to keep expanding upon this story. But even that isn't a big deal to me anymore because the story they do tell is incredible. God of War's story is special and if nothing else it shows the world that Kratos all of us fans knew he was and could be deep down. Once again, there is a lot to go over in regards to God of War 4's gameplay, and amongst fans of the series, this is the most divisive aspect of the game. So let me get my two cents out there before we begin to dissect the gameplay. The gameplay is the aspect of God of War 4 that initially turned me off of the game. I just wasn't a fan of the change perspective, the lack of various combinations, dismissing the platforming challenges, and repeat puzzle design. I just couldn't get on board with this massive change in direction at release, and for those of you watching this retrospective series without playing the games for yourself, let me give you an example of how big a change like this is. Could you ever see Devil May Cry or Bayonetta doing something like this? I honestly can't, nor would I ever want that, and that is exactly how I felt back in 2018. So what changed in the past three years? Because yet again, the gameplay for God of War 4 was much better than I remember. Well, this time around, I'd finished replaying six God of War titles back to back, and whilst I loved the God of War formula, I definitely was ready for something new. Did it have to be this drastically different? I don't think so, but I was more than willing to give the new style of gameplay a chance this time around, and I think because of that, I ended up thoroughly enjoying my time playing God of War 4. But it isn't without flaws. In fact, I do have a few continued problems with the new gameplay still to this day, so enough stalling and let's get stuck into it. First and foremost, the combat has always been the bread and butter for the God of War series, and God of War 4 is no different in that regard, except for the fact that it really is about 95% of the actual gameplay. So let's get the other 5% out of the way right now. The platforming is almost non-existent here. I mean, we don't even have the ability to freely jump anymore, so all the platforming boils down to is holding a direction to climb and press X to cross larger gaps. The puzzles, on the other hand, are still here, but more often than not are the same thing over and over again. There are some outliers, don't get me wrong, but you'll usually just be looking for the same urns or bells, a board to smack or a gear to freeze, that sort of thing. The problem with removing so much from both the puzzles and platforming is you really are banking on the combat to be, well, the be all and end all. And whilst I think the game does still pace out the combat encounters well, with the slower, more deliberate segments, and let the player really take in and listen to this story, in regards to actually playing the game, it does feel lesser than previous entries, which I'll touch on a little further later in the video, but now we've got gotten that other 5% out of the way, let's talk the meat and potatoes. Okay, so the combat this time around takes on a much more third person perspective with the camera right up close to Kratos. You have access to the Leviathan Axe, your fists, a retractable shield, the Rage of Sparta, and then about halfway through you also gain access to the tried and true Blades of Chaos, as well as making use of Atreus's archery with light and electric arrows. Both your axe and blade can be leveled up, increasing their damage along with equipping runic attacks that you find or purchase throughout the world, and hilts that give both weapons a special ability, and Atreus can summon a friendly beast, again depending depending on what one you've found or purchased. All of these options and abilities are important, as well as the wealth of armor choices to choose from and create for Kratos and Atreus, because Kratos' overall level in God of War 4 is very important.
important when tackling the enemies as each one will have a certain level of difficulty now. And the higher that level is from Kratos, the quicker you'll meet your end. I'm going to touch on the leveling a little later in the video because it ties into a larger point I want to make. So back to the actual combat. Now, in terms of feel, God of War 4's combat still has a great feeling of flow about it, especially once you unlock the blades. You have a light and heavy attack for both weapons, a throwing ability, a couple of various combinations, parrying, evading, and blocking, along with whatever runic abilities you have equipped, and Atreus's attacks, and when it all comes together as the player, you do get that feeling of strength, fluidity and flow that has made this series so great. Whilst I wouldn't call the combat a hack and slasher anymore, favoring a more Souls-like system, some of what made the old God of War games so great is still present here in God of War 4's combat. You don't have as many combinations and without a jump button you are limited to more stationary combat moves but it's still great fun swinging around your blades or hurling your axe into pesky Draugr or activating the Rage of Sparta and just wailing on poor souls. When it all comes together, it feels great. The big but in that statement though is when enemies are in front of you. You see, the way the camera is positioned is just a little too close to Kratos this time around, meaning if the enemies aren't in front of you, your eyes are going to be heavily fixated on the arrows or spidey sensors around Kratos' hips. So when you dodge or parry an enemy's attacks, when they're behind you, it doesn't feel as satisfying or fluent as it should. You do have a quick turn to try and minimize how exposed you are with this camera angle, but I don't see why they couldn't just pull this back even just a touch to lessen the emphasis on your incoming damage meter. This isn't a huge issue and I got used to the new perspective rather quickly I must say, which is why I found myself falling into that flow state more often than not. But it is a big change and I don't think Santa Monica nailed the execution. I think an enemy that highlights what I'm trying to get across most is the Revenants. The Revenants are an enemy type that appear and disappear, only being able to be attacked once stunned by Atreus' bow, but they have an attack that is a long homing ground base attack that if they aren't in front of you makes it nearly impossible to avoid consistently. I don't mind facing off against the Revenants, they are always a good source of challenge in encounters, but they are already at times a pain to fight when waiting to stun them without factoring in finding them in the first place. Moving on from the camera angle though, as I said the combat itself is a lot simpler than in previous entries, making the combat largely feel more repetitious than before. Without the wealth of various combinations and freedom in movement this time around, Round. You do still have a few different combinations you can throw together and unlock, don't get me wrong, but just not as much and with very little visual difference. So to try and combat this, Santa Monica implemented a few systems to try and change up encounters from one to another. One such way is through the different armor sets, hilt and runic abilities for both the Blades of Chaos and the Leviathan Axe. In God of War 4, Kratos is a lot more customizable. You can choose whether you want an armor set or piece that increases Kratos' resistance to enemies, strength of his attacks, how quickly runic abilities recharge, etc. There are a huge amount of runes to find, purchase or unlock with their own unique abilities like stunning enemies, coating the axe in frost to increase damage, iconic moves for the blades like the cyclone, and you can even equip Atreus with a special summon that again can do anything from stunning enemies, damaging them or distracting them. You have a lot of options to choose from and you'll frequently be finding new materials for new armor, new runes, new abilities, so there is some form of rotating your arsenal and abilities, but when you find something you like, you can level it up to a certain extent to keep it relevant, though that mainly pertains to the runes and not armor. Armor definitely has a use by date. Now, this system works best when you're finding abilities that work best, testing everything out, and when this is happening, the combat does fend off that repetition enough to keep the same encounters fun. It's when you find abilities like the Ice Beam that is just too good to ever remove, for example, that this system hits its ceiling. And I'll give you an example. The Ice Beam is objectively the best ability for the Leviathan Axe. Its damage output is just 
insane, especially, obviously, against enemies with some form of weakness to frost. It destroys health bars, even bosses, so that's a runic slot taken right there, meaning you've only got one more to find what suits your playstyle best. This really isn't a huge deal that you can find objectively better abilities than others, but I think this system would have thrived a bit better if it wasn't one of the only ways to keep combat fresh and interesting. I actually really like this system and molding Kratos into the type of warrior I want to be and how to best suit my own style of play, but it just isn't quite there in my opinion, which tags onto the next big system Santa Monica implemented to try and keep the combat fresh, and that is through the leveling system. Put it simply, I'm not a big fan of this system. It's not terrible, and I understand what Santa Monica was trying to accomplish, but it just feels unnecessary. Every piece of armor you choose, what level your weapons are, the enchantments, etc., it all compiles into Kratos' overall level, which drastically impacts how Kratos will fare in any given encounter. Now, if you just focus on the main story missions first, this whole system isn't going to phase you. You'll level up enough to be the right level to take on the foes thrown at you without too much issue. My issue with this system is the enemy levels just feel so lazy. I mean, if you encounter an enemy a couple of levels higher than yourself, even if it's an enemy you've slain before numerous times, they'll one hit kill you just because of that number above them. It's not like the high level enemies are new enemies with new movesets, they're the exact same as before, just for some reason can kill you if you screw up once. It just feels like a system there to encourage you to keep changing your equipment up and in those optional encounters simply say, come back after the story. Which brings me to the elephant in the room and why I may sound a bit more negative than I intend and that is God of War 4's more open world nature. God of War 4 has a lot of optional objectives, whether that be side missions, extra realms, collectibles, whatever it may be, there is a lot to do here. And because of the leveling system, I went through the main story content, exploring a little bit along the way, but mostly left all this side content till after I'd finished the main story. Now, before I dive into my thoughts on the side content, I wanna say one thing. When I finished up with the main story, in my mind, this was one of the best God of War experiences I'd had. It took me around 18 hours to get through the main story, and I was blown away. Where my opinion skewed towards the more negative side was after I spent about an hour doing the optional content because a lot of it does feel like filler. Obviously, this is all optional, and thank god it is, because I actually couldn't push myself to 100% God of War 4. The optional objectives killed any will I had to do so pretty damn quickly, because it's here where a lot of the issues I've gone over come to light the most. The lazy level system, the repetition in enemy encounters, the lack of combinations. Don't get me wrong, I love the stories attached to these side missions and being in this world, just what I was doing got old very quickly. What broke my will to complete God of War 4 though was the two optional realms in Muspelheim and Niflheim. Because they aren't the same realms we've experienced through the main story, and instead they are either a huge grind or a gauntlet of different challenges. Thankfully, these again are optional, but what killed my interest in pursuing this Platinum and 100% in general after loving the main game was just how boring I found these realms. So much so that I didn't even want to pursue the Valkyries because two of them are in these realms and spending any more time there was not something I wanted to do at all. I will say Muspelheim is better than Niflheim, as the challenges can actually be some fun, and the infinite grind of Niflheim is just something that I found incredibly tedious immediately. Once again, I know these are all optional, and again, I'm not saying it's all bad, but the longer you spend with God of War 4, the more problems come to light, at least that's what I experienced. On the positive side, exploring and finding these unique stories, secret 
lore shrines and experiencing moments that add further to this world is enjoyable and why I still spent a good five or so hours with just the optional aspects of the game. I'm not saying the game being more open is necessarily a bad thing and moments like freeing a dragon, finding and defeating the Valkyries or finding out what happened to a father's backstabbing son are all really great moments outside of the main story. But the other God of War titles were max like 10 hours and God of War 4 is probably 20 plus which means repetition will rear its ugly head and make the changes to the gameplay that don't pan out all the more visible. Meaning fighting the same enemies for a good 20 hours is going to wear on you and with the changes to combat and lack of experimentation or combinations it is more noticeable. And without meaningful platforming and repetitive puzzles the combat flaws come to full focus the longer you play. I know it feels like I'm bashing this game's gameplay so let's talk bosses. First off let me say on their own the bosses are a lot of fun to face off against. My main issue with the bosses though is how often they repeat. I mean you'll be facing off against reskins of the same trolls, stone giants, even fighting boulder multiple times and the valkyrie whilst different in moveset at least in vibe feel like you're doing the same thing again. So instead of going over every boss in the game which is filled with trolls and giants I'm just going to go over the boulder fight as a whole, the fight against Vartal Yoffa, the dragon fight, Modi and Magni and how the Valkyrie fights I encountered play and feel. Let's start with Boulder who I must acknowledge whilst yes we encounter him a few times throughout the story I don't actually mind that as it adds to his character and story and each fight feels great to play. The first encounter you're still getting used to all the new mechanics so whilst he packs a real punch his attacks are simple enough to dodge and parry and this is very much a battle to get you comfortable with the controls and make you feel powerful in the process which boy does it succeed. Straight up there are some epic Dragon Ball Z like moments in the first encounter with Boulder that whilst aren't the most player driven feel badass and all come from wailing on the invincible god which keeps the player engaged. The second encounter with Boulder does favour the spectacle over the battle which isn't something new for the series but it does feel great to battle atop this armoured dragon and again wailing on Boulder just feels good. The third and last encounter is clearly the peak boulder fight. I mean, finally, he can be killed, so the battle gets that feeling of gratification it has been building towards. Boulder here is a much different opponent though. He is a lot quicker, changes between frost and fire requiring you to change up your weapons. Freya will try and stop you both frequently and whilst I didn't find this fight too challenging, Boulder has a lot of health and this is a lengthy fight that always feels like it's adding something different. That final fight with Boulder is one of my favourites in the series. The mix between story and gameplay satisfaction was incredible and Boulder is just a a great opponent. Next is the battle against Zvartal Yoffa, which is actually a good challenge for the early game. He is very quick, his flight makes the rage ability harder to maximize its efficiency, the darkness he engulfs the arena in obviously makes his attacks difficult to avoid and all this makes for a great battle when Kratos' arsenal is more limited than in other fights. One of the game's strongest boss battles and a lot of fun to conquer which is what I look for in a good boss fight. Next is the fight against the dragon Hrazla, which is unfortunately a rather simple fight. Again, Spectacle wins here and facing off against this massive dragon feels cool and visually is amazing but the fight boils down to throwing the red orbs at the dragon to stun it and then do enough damage to impale it. Great spectacle, not a great fight. The Magni and Modi fight is an interesting one. For being a battle against two gods it isn't very challenging which isn't make or break for me in this series but something I personally enjoy and what I find engages me in the fights. The fight is split up into three phases and you'll need to knock both Magni and Modi's health down enough to initiate a strange circling minigame waiting for one of the gods to run in and attack to block them. Both the gods attacks are well telegraphed and I just feel like you can wail on them without consequence a bit too often. 
I enjoyed this battle and the story implications, but not the best fight from a player perspective. The Valkyries are great fights though, which is why I'm disappointed some were locked behind the lackluster realms. Yes, visually they appear very similar, but each Valkyrie has their own moveset and tactics that make them a real challenge to come up against. Like Zvartal Yoffa, the flight of the Valkyries makes utilizing the rage ability effectively much more difficult, making the player rely on the blood Blades, Axe, Runes and Atreus much more and because each Valkyrie is different in moveset or tactics means you lose that feeling of repetition and always feel like you're about to be put to the test. I really wish I could have pushed through to see the Valkyrie quest through to the end because I've heard great things about the final fight but just from the four or five fights I experienced these are great fun and a great challenge to boot. After all of this I know how it sounds. I must have really disliked God of War 4 and that simply isn't true. Yes, I have my problems with the game as I've made perfectly clear, but I'm telling you I had so much fun playing the game in the moment, especially when the story was behind the gameplay. I loved swinging and throwing around the axe, the blades feel right at home both in this world and feel true to form from the previous games. Finding new runes, making new armor, exploring this incredible world and slaying everything from gods to dragons to draugr to valkyries to trolls and ancients, it all is something I had a blast with. God of War 4 is a great game to play, but after that story came to an end I realized what a lot of the changes in mechanics and new systems meant for the long run. It's not perfect, in fact there is a lot you can point out and say, hey what about this? But overall I did have fun playing this game and at the end of the day that's what is most important. So after all of this is God of War 2018 better than I remember? I think I gave it away a few times but yes absolutely. Don't get me wrong, I know to some people's surprise perhaps, the fanbase is divided on this game. And trust me, if you were to tell me you hate this game, I get it. But on the flip side now, if you were to tell me you love this game, and it's your favourite in the series, I get that too. For me though, I just love this story. I loved how they moved Kratos' character forward in a way that makes sense as a fan of the series. Getting more limelight into Kratos' emotions outside of rage and how he interacts and learns about this foreign world. How well the other characters like Atreus, Freya, Mimir and Boulder are fleshed out. I mean, when I say I was captivated, it doesn't even scratch the surface. The gameplay is where I'm more torn, but again, the weapons feel great to use. The combat, while simple, is still enjoyable. Truly highlighted when you come up against some of the great boss battles throughout, and exploring the world is all good fun. I do wish the camera was a bit pulled back, more combinations wouldn't have hurt, more involved platforming and different puzzles would be great, and more worthwhile extra realms would have been a big step into making me want to complete all of the game. But at the end of the day, the game is a good time to play even if it is heavily carried, in my opinion, by the narrative. God of War 4 really did surprise me though, and I'm glad I finally gave the game another shot, without the pure nostalgic memories of the rest of the series. Because I had a blast here. It's not perfect, but it is great enough to give me hope that Ragnarok has all the tools to build upon this game and only get better. But until that day comes, this is it for the God of War series. And what a game to end it on. Alright, now to the part of this behemoth of a video that I'm sure many of you have been waiting for. We've revisited and reviewed all seven God of War games, and now it's time to rank them. Just a couple of things before we start though, first of all, I shouldn't have to say this, but I will. This is all my opinion. You may disagree with certain placements, maybe I rank your favourite game at the bottom and least favourite at the top. I'm not you, so feel free to do your own personal rankings in the comments, or you know, you can also make a video. Secondly, I don't think any of the God of War games are bad. I enjoyed revisiting the whole series, but obviously I enjoyed some more than others and that's how I'm ranking them. So just because a game isn't number one or two doesn't mean it's terrible, just I enjoyed playing through another game in the series more. 
Okay, with those two points out of the way, let's get this started. Coming in at number 7 is God of War Ascension. I don't think this one is too much of a surprise, but I just think in an effort to combat a feeling of sameness or fatigue with the formula, they made the combat feel a little off. Again, not unenjoyable, with some real highlights it must be said like the Gemini fight or the spectacle of fighting Electo, and the story highlighting Kratos' loss of his wife and daughter really well are all great, but fighting in the many enemy encounters just wasn't as sad satisfying as in previous entries. At number 6 we have God of War Chains of Olympus and I have to be honest this one hurts my nostalgia a little bit. I played this game so much growing up, replaying the game over and over and over again and for a God of War portable experience, Ready at Dawn did an incredible job emulating the console God of War games. But the story is rather forgettable, and the combat, even though it released after God of War 2, feels like God of War 1 with less combinations and some straight up useless ones to boot. I do still love Zeus's gauntlet though, that is a top tier secondary weapon in the series, and boss battles like Karen are still good fun. At number 5 is God of War Ghost of Sparta, which is above Chains of Olympus for a few reasons. The combat feels much more like God of War 2, which is a net positive. The story about Kratos and his brother Deimos is really interesting, and there's just something about this game that makes me think I could go back and give the game another go sooner rather than later. Once again, Ready at Dawn did an incredible job emulating the God of War games for a portable platform, but both are missing the different platforming and puzzle challenges that mix up the game from combat encounter to combat encounter, which means for me personally they just can't top the console experiences, bar ascension. Coming in at number 4 we have another hit to the nostalgia and that is God of War 2004. My nostalgia levels towards God of War 1 are astronomical. Even after revisiting the game today and finding it to have dated quite a bit, I still have that voice saying it's the best. The story here is without a doubt one of the best in the series, setting up a character with so much depth and intrigue to make a series at this point last 7 games. And whilst I'm nostalgic for all the memories in these environments and against these enemies and bosses, again the game has been surpassed in the gameplay department by its successes. A lot of combinations feel useless compared to the others without stunning features, wall combat is terrible, and overall the game just has aged. But for me, 4 is as low as I can go on this game, and I don't even feel great about it now. I could easily go back and boot this game up right now, and I think that says a lot. At number 3 we have a game in the series that people seem to either have it as their favourite or least favourite in the series, and that is God of War. 2018. I understand why people loathe this game, as well as I understand those who love it. My thoughts on this game should be pretty fresh in your mind though, so I'm not going to repeat myself too much. For me, the story, the world, and boss battles like Boulder and the Valkyries pull God of War 4 up to number 3. And look, I had a ton of fun playing this game all around. But the combat isn't as strong, and the platforming and puzzles are either repetitive or completely stripped. The journey of this game though was so damn captivating and whilst I don't think it's the best game ever or even in this series, it is up there with the best which for such a massive change up is impressive and has me hopeful that Ragnarok can be even better. Okay, these final two games are incredibly close, which wasn't something I expected coming into revisiting this series. I almost consider them just to be one experience, but if we're splitting hairs, number two goes to God of War 2. God of War 2 was some of the most fun I had in this series, which took me by surprise when I didn't remember really anything about this game going in. 
setting up the plot to take out Zeus, fueling that vengeance, the massive improvement to combat, the great boss battles, puzzles and platforming being worthwhile breaks from combat. It was as if the game took all my God of War 1 nostalgia and said it was as good as you remember. I mean the game holds up incredibly for being 14 years old. The combinations are fluent, the spectacles are all here. I think if I'd remembered God of War 2 a bit better and formed more nostalgia, the game could easily be number one. I'd play it again right now. But of course, at number one, we have God of War 3. I think this one again surprised no one. Other games in this series may do certain things better than God of War 3, but no one tops this game's combat and pure badass moments. I could play this game over and over right now. It is just so damn fluent. The combinations, the weapons, the incredible bosses like Hades and Zeus, the spectacle of the world, the conclusion of this epic tale of revenge in the Greek world, it all is so compelling and captivating. Again, I think God of War 1, 2 and 4 all have the upper hand in story, but nothing tops this game to me in terms of how it is to play, and even if Ragnarok comes out and is like the God of War 3 for the Norse world, my nostalgia and love for this game probably wouldn't let me budge on this ranking. The game's just too good, too much fun, and for me is the pinnacle of the God of War series. And with all of that, we're finally done with the God of War series. Once again, let me know your own personal rankings down in the comments below because there is no right or wrong answer here. It's just personal preference. If you stuck it through to the end or watched each video as they released, well done, I'm proud of you. If you cheated and skipped ahead to the rankings, I still love you. I hope you all enjoyed this massive video though, I had a blast revisiting the God of War series and now I can't wait to get started revisiting Darksiders and Castlevania Lords of Shadows. As voted in by my lovely subscribers, so subscribe to have a say in what videos you want to see. But I think this video is long enough, go subscribe, follow my socials, all that good stuff and I'll see you all in the next video. Oh, and enjoy the holidays.